Please take your seats. We're about to start. Accompanying us this evening on the Star Spangled on the piano is Jane Howard. Please rise. Come to order. Thank you very much, Ms. Howard. Uh, are there any town meeting members who have yet to be sworn in? If anyone hasn't been sworn in, please rise. Well, I guess all the people standing haven't been sworn in yet. Okay. Um, the Girls Tennis Club is having a bake sale today. Um, Mr. Gilligan, do you want to do your... Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Stephen Gilligan, Town Treasurer. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, members of town meeting, I'd like to introduce you all to Mr. Michael Morse, who's the town's new Deputy Treasurer and Deputy Collector of Taxes. I know that some of you had the opportunity to meet and greet with Michael in the rear of the hall prior to the meetings commencement, but I wanted to introduce uh, Michael to all of you and to the town at large. Michael. Uh, Michael comes with, with exceptional skills and stellar background, and this is his sixth day on the job, and since he had time to think about it over the weekend, I guess he likes us. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Moderator. Thank you. Congratulations, sir. Mr. Byrne, is he going to introduce you? Yeah. Um, before I begin, I would like to say that my colleagues on the board will be down shortly. They are just wrapping up a selectmen's meeting. Um, and it is moved that if all the business of the meeting as set forth in the warrant for the annual town meeting is not disposed of at this session, when the meeting adjourns, it adjourns to Wednesday, May 14th, 2014, at 8 p.m. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? And uh, now I'd like, vote. I would like to recognize uh, Mr. Greeley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Kevin Greeley, uh, Precinct uh, 11, town, uh, member of the Board of Selectmen, uh, highly anticipated coming attraction at Mount Pleasant Cemetery. <laughs> and tonight I rise here because uh, I'm also the liaison to TAC from the Board of Selectmen. I'm not sure whether you are aware or not, but in Arlington we have somewhere near 100 committees, commissions, and boards, most of which are peopled by volunteers. The Board of Selectmen felt two such volunteers are deserving of receiving this permission this evening. So Mr. Moderator, I'd like to, to ask your permission to allow Mr. Edward Starr 
and also to allow Elizabeth Carr Jones to be part of the meeting here this evening, sir, on the floor. So allowed. So these proclamations come from the time of the town crier when a board of selectmen or other board of the town would pass something and then the town crier would go out and read the news the next day. So there's a lot of whereases and now therefore. And I do public proclamations. So I need you to help me. Every time I point at you, I need you to say whereas. And if you don't do it well enough, I will call on individuals around the hall. So here we go. Here we go, number one. Very nice. Arlington is blessed with many citizens who willingly volunteer their time, efforts, and expertise to make important contributions to the well-being and betterment of our community. But there are individuals whose dedication, integrity, and selfless contributions to the public good merit more than quiet thanks and... Yes. Oh, lovely. Two such individuals, Elizabeth Carr Jones and Edward Starr, deserve a moment in the community spotlight. Although they would be among the last to seek it out or expect it. And yes. you're getting stronger. Elizabeth and Ed are two of the original members of TAC 12 years ago now and have been instrumental in establishing and leading this board in its countless undertakings with state agencies, town boards, and committees. They have assisted both residents and business owners to develop significant transportation improvements and enhance the safety for all users of our roads and walkways. Yes! <laughs> I didn't think you'd get into it this much. They have ushered through many, it's because of you two, they're getting so hot here. They have ushered through many noteworthy projects, including the Mass Ave Corridor Project, Route 60, redevelopment of the Sims and the Brigham's properties, and the townwide, never mind the booing, and the townwide Safe Routes to School program. And one more. There is no school, major roadway, or intersection in Arlington where their influence has not been felt. There are few words available to properly express our deepest thanks for Ed's and Elizabeth's selfless dedication to TAC mandates and our admiration for their consistent devotion to Arlington and its citizens. Now, therefore, be it resolved that we, the Arlington Board of Selectmen, do thank Elizabeth Carr Jones and Edward Starr for their many exemplary, important, and irreplaceable contributions which have made Arlington a much more vibrant, progressive, and safer community, and be it further resolved that we, the Arlington Board of Selectmen, do hereby name this 12th day of May, 2014, to be Edward Starr and Elizabeth Carr Jones Day throughout the town of Arlington, and ask all citizens to pay heed thereto. Ladies and gentlemen, Ed and Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Board of Selectmen and Town Meeting. The, the group we have been working with is a wonderful group of volunteers and members of the town staff. These members of the town staff are both capable and very, very uh, interested and hardworking. Uh, these members are uh, Wayne Chenaud and uh, Mike Rodemaker from the Department of Public Works, Laura Wiener from Planny, and Corey Ratto from the Arlington Police Department. Together, this has been a wonderful team working together. We've had fun, we've made progress here and there. And uh, thank you. 
we're really grateful for this recognition and it's made especially humbling by the presence of so many people who have done so much. Thank you. Thank you both, Ed and Elizabeth. You ready for a test vote? We're going to take a test vote, make sure our um, clickers work. Uh, it's not in our bylaws, but we've always traditionally held that only members within the enclosure can vote. And that would mean within these lower four walls, it's come to my attention that some people have been voting from the balcony. And I understand someone may have even tried to vote from Sims Mini Market, <laughs> which is definitely outside the enclosure. Um, the, the reason for that is if you're not within the enclosure, you really can't be actively taking part in the debate and getting the feel of the meeting. So I was going to ask if we could refrain from wandering too far from the first floor. So all in favor of voting within the enclosure, please press 1 at this time. And all opposed, want to vote anywhere they can press no. Oh, timer. So, we ready? Yep, go ahead and vote. No, it's just a feel of the meeting. Okay, that's it. Time's up. Okay, we have a uh, hundred fifty-eight. Oh, it passed. Everyone wants to vote within the enclosure. Very good. You're going to run through the names so people can check their votes, make sure the machine worked properly, and then we're going to have any announcements or resolutions. Does anyone have any? Oh, here we go. Oh, look, it started on, on number one, too. Oh, Richie wants to vote from home. Are there any announcements? Yes, Angela. Angela Olszewski, Precinct 17. I just wanted to let you know that the Arlington Historical Society will be hosting the author Elaine Marie Cooper this Saturday, May 17th at 2 p.m. at the Jason Russell House Smith Museum. Um, Elaine has written Fields of the Fatherless, and it's a historical fiction novel about Betsy Russell, the daughter of Jason Russell, and it takes place here in Monotomy. Um, the book is pretty much, I think the age range is maybe pre-tween to tween, but I'm um, sure anybody who's interested in um, Arlington's history um, might like to come, and um, the book rack will be there selling the books for the author to sign. Thank you. Chapdelaine. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. Uh, I just have several brief announcements. First, I wanted to let town meeting know and make a brief introduction. Uh, we're hosting two uh, Pakistani municipal officials for the next two weeks as part of a collaborative process with the Mass Municipal Association and the State Department. Uh, so they're here tonight to witness town meeting. It's their first day in Arlington. They're going to spend the next two weeks here, and I just want to introduce you to them. We have Roxana Aziz and Sanam Zafar. If you want to just stand up and say hello. They asked me today what the challenges of our government were, and I said, well, you come tonight. And we'll, 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 we can, we can learn. Um, and, and just two very brief announcements in the back table tonight. Uh, there is a memo for me to town meeting members in regards to some of the energy efficiency uh, work and efforts we've made over the past year, specifically an update on the energy efficiency funds that town meeting appropriated in the amount of $200,000 back in 2012. And some of the uses of that, or all of the uses of that to date, are included on that memo. And also in regards to Article 39, Warrant Article 39, the Water Bodies Fund, there is an accounting of past expenditures and projected future expenditures from that uh, account that can also be found on the back table. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Sir.
Oh, can he do that? I mean, no, I can't. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't have three hours here. Uh, Mr. Greeley is insisting that I announce that my wife and I are expecting our first child in November. <laughs> No, John. John is a perfectly fine name. Any other announcements or resolutions? Seeing none. Um, if we speed along, we could probably finish maybe tonight, maybe Wednesday. We don't waste too much time. Ma'am, you want to give a report? Come on up. Oh, the report of a committee? Yes. Uh, we have, uh, I wait? Yeah, Article 3. Well, without announcements or resolutions, now we're on to Article 3, reports of committees. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator and town meeting. I'm Ann LaRoyer from Precinct 17. Right into and, the mic. And I'm uh, chair of the Open Space Committee. And the Open Space Committee report for 2013 is printed in the town's annual report, which is available at the back of the room and on the website. So I didn't reprint it, but I did want to speak briefly because we're right now in the midst of updating our current open space and recreation plan. And next year, we will be presenting it to you for endorsement. In the meantime, we welcome your ideas and feedback on the plan, and you can contact me directly or through the planning department if you wish to make any comments. Um, let me just tell you about the uh, open space committee briefly. It was created by town meeting back in 1996 and our 10 members are appointed by the town manager for three-year terms uh, according to state guidelines. The group includes representatives of the Park and Recreation Commission, Conservation Commission, Cemetery Commission, Redevelopment Board, Vision 2020, Department of Public Works, and then several citizens. We do not own or manage any land in Arlington. Our mission and our primary responsibilities are to develop and monitor the town's open space and recreation plan, a long document which is available on the town website and lays out lots of information about the town's open spaces, natural resources, and recreational facilities. This planning process and the types of information included in the plan are guided by the State Executive Office of Energy and Environmental, Environmental Affairs which has to review and finally approve the plan. The first open space plan in Arlington was completed in 1996, and the current plan was presented to and endorsed by the Board of Selectmen, the Redevelopment Board, and this town meeting in 2007. It is set to expire this December, so we are now in the process of updating and revising the plan to cover the next seven years uh, from 2015 up to 2022, just kind of mind-boggling <laughs> to think about. But we are um, looking at the goals and objectives that were laid out in the 2007 plan and putting together an impressive list of accomplishments and positive changes that have happened um, over the past years that are reflected in the original goals and objectives. Things like the purchase of Elizabeth Island by the Arlington Land Trust, which ensures its uh, public access and its permanent conservation. Um, that's the island in Spy Pond, for those who don't know. Um, construction of an accessible playground and a multi-generational park at the Summer Street Sports Complex area, and regular removal and treatment of weeds and invasive plants in our highly prized water bodies. Those are just a very few of the things that have been accomplished in the last few years. Uh, we are relying, to update this plan, we're relying on input from many different individuals, organizations, and other sources, and uh, including the results of the Vision 2020 survey, which we heard about last week, which included some specific questions about open space. We're also working with the Master Plan Committee, because there's a lot of overlap between the open space plan and the master plan, and it's actually very opportune that these two plans are working um, in tandem at, at this moment. In fact, I do want to mention that the next master plan meeting is on uh, Thursday, uh, this coming Thursday, May 15th, and the focus will be on open space and natural resources. 
and the report, the working paper, is going to be posted up on the website as all of the other working papers have been. So I encourage you to look at that, um, to respond to the survey that will be available on the website, and to attend the meeting on Thursday night if you possibly can after all these town meeting meetings. Um, it'll be held at 7 o'clock at the Senior Center. And on behalf of the committee, I just want to thank town meeting for, first of all, for passing the CDBG budget last week. Um, it includes a small allocation that will um, help our volunteer committee hire a planning consultant to undertake some other research and analysis for the plan and to provide technical support for designing and producing the final printed report and which will also, of course, be on the website. And I also want to thank Tom Beening for approving the CPA article. Um, I didn't get to talk last time, but um, all, this way all the voters will have a chance to weigh in on the next, uh, next November um, on the option of a CPA surcharge to support, of course, open space and recreation projects as well as historic preservation and housing needs as we heard about in length. So the next open space plan, which will cover 2015 to 2022, will provide a wealth of information about our current resources, facilities, and programs, and it will be a call for action to do even more to enhance and maintain our valuable open spaces for years to come. So thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Hainer. Bill Hainer, Chairman of the Arlington School Committee. Mr. Moderator and town meeting members. I would like to present the Arlington School Committee's 2015 budget and additional information. I want to thank the community for its financial support for the new Thompson Elementary School and their generosity for making the Bill Shea Memorial Library possible. This year, the district implemented the new Massachusetts Teacher Evaluation System that has as its goal the continuous improvement and accountability of all our staff. Teachers are also implementing the Common Core State Standards. We are participating this spring in the pilot of the new state assessment program park that will eventually replace MCAS. We ask so much of all our staff, especially our classroom teachers. I want to commend their work and diligence to the town meeting. Student enrollment continues to grow, causing added pressures on our budget. When today's Arlington School high school seniors were in kindergarten, the district had 4,265 students. As they graduate next month, we have 5,157 students in the district. The enrollment grew by 21% while these students were in the system. Thanks to the collaborative work of the school committee, school administration, town manager, board of selectmen, and finance committee, a formula was created to provide for funding for enrollment growth. The New England Association of Schools and Colleges visited our high school in December 2012, which resulted in a report commending our academic programs but listing great concerns about our facilities, stressing how they were impacting educational programs. I recommend that you take the time to read the full report at our district website in the Arlington High School Facilities Information section. The school committee and the Board of Selectmen unanimously voted to file a statement of interest with the Massachusetts School Building Authority in March to seek financial assistance to upgrade the high school facilities as needed. The Arlington School Department has had three successful administrative searches this year, resulting in two new elementary principals and a permanent director of special education. These are only a few of the things that have happened during the year. The Arlington School Committee is committed to providing the best education for all the students of Arlington. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Cole. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, John Cole, Chair of the Permanent Town Building Committee. I would like to show you a few slides tonight and review the, the work that we've done over the past year. You may recall two years ago we completed envelope repairs to the central fire station, and during the past year we have uh, proceeded with design work for the interior. We will have that before you under the capital plan uh, shortly. The scope of this project includes structural, electrical, and mechanical upgrades, uh, new administrative offices, which will allow the chief to move back uh, to be in contact with his forces, 
and reconfiguration and refurbishment of the living quarters. I think you can see from the slides, uh, this is a project that is desperately in need of happening. Uh, last Thursday, we received eight general bids for the project, uh, two of which were under our estimate. Uh, we are in the process now of checking references on those two low bidders, but feel confident that we can reach contract uh, within the allocation in the capital plan of six million fifty thousand uh, dollars. Subject to your vote, the project will begin July 1st and be completed in the spring of next year. Second project I'd like to talk about briefly is the replacement of the slate roof on the historic portions of the Robbins Library. This was, work was done over the summer. Uh, was finished successfully about $90,000 under a budget of $460,000. Um, you can see from the photos and if you are out on Mass Ave that the metal work uh, along the roof now is a little bit bright. Uh, it was specifically chosen to match the metal work on the 1980 edition and over time uh, it will dull to a, a value equal to the other building. So. Don't despair if it's a little shiny now. Uh, I'd also like to update you on the community safety building. Uh, this has continued to be the most difficult project uh, in my tenure on the building committee. Uh, we have had um, latent conditions, which I explained last year, of things that were uncovered in the course of the work that needed to be corrected. We've also had some performance issues with the contractor, and frankly, I don't think they had any idea of the rigor to which we were going to hold them. We are now in the process of closing out the project. These are recent photos, not that one, back up. Recent photos of the uh, Mystic Street side and the uh, courtyard side. Um, we are negotiating a, a settlement with the contractor for time delay at this point, and we're also doing some final testing. It is my sincere hope that this will be completed in the next month or two. As I stated last year, our goal is to return this building to the town as a capital asset, not an operating liability, and we shall do it. We are going to complete the interior renovation of this project as well, and we are seeking funding this year uh, for that phase of the work. Uh, this will upgrade the public areas on the first floor in particular. One of the issues that I find most disconcerting is that anyone coming in to file a complaint uh, has to do so publicly in the, in the lobby. There's no private area for that, and I think given the range of incidents that the police department deals with, that's an unfortunate condition which will be corrected. Uh, there are some safety issues to be addressed in the cell block area where the, the doors currently are swing doors and they have been used as weapons by uh, people in detention to hit officers uh, as they open the cell doors. So those will be changed to sliding doors We'll also upgrade mechanical electrical systems and refurbish uh, public areas and the offices on the second floor. Uh, we are seeking $373,000 for the design phase of that work and that is in the, the capital plan. Lastly, I would like to show you the new Thompson School. Uh, the project was completed in the fall. The Permanent Town Building Committee had members on the overall committee along with uh, Thompson school members, uh, school administration, and other town boards. And I'd like to thank Kathy Bodie in particular for chairing that committee and doing a terrific job. The project finished uh, $300,000 under a budget of $20.6 million which I think was quite an accomplishment. And in terms of the design, 
It was a conscious effort to depart from the little brick red schoolhouses in Arlington and try something more colorful, which I believe has been successfully received by certainly the kids, but the community as well. Last one. Lastly, I'm very happy to tell you about the Bill Shea Memorial Library. Uh, we've raised over $100,000 to provide uh, learning <coughs> materials for the kids in that school. Uh, and I would dearly like to thank members of this body who contributed, and particularly uh, Clarissa Rowe, who co-chaired the effort and brought it to a successful conclusion. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any other reports? Mr. McKinney, then Mr. Marr. I think I'll have to read my own. I forgot to bring my script. To our, um, to our visitors, Salam Alaikum. Um, you'll be seeing a very interesting bit of American history. And right now, my company is doing some work with an engineer named Sammy in Rawalpindi. <laughs> so we shall continue to our success, inshallah. Um, I hope you don't mind if I sort of have to look. You have to speak right into Mike Lawrence. That's what they're saying. Okay. Better? Yes. Okay. It's been five years, and we finally managed to pull, a, pull off something which we didn't think we could do, which is the rehabilitation of Uncle Sam. That is to say, Samuel Wilson is a vibrant part of our own, our own culture here. We started in 2008. We started with only $300. Uh, the, the committee hadn't met in five years. There was $300 left. We got a tent, a banner, did our first tourism survey. In 2009, we learned the problem we were facing. It wasn't just the fact that people loved Uncle Sam. It wasn't the fact that we didn't have any money. The fact that people were thinking that Uncle Sam was a cartoon and he wasn't really worth the uh, effort of a serious uh, effort. And it's true, these are great historical sites, but the Schwamm Mill, the Jason Russell House, the Dallin Museum, they have sites, they have property, they have programs, supporters, and history. But they remain obscure in the popular tourist radar. Uncle Sam is universally known. But how can an 1812 joke in Troy, New York be added to Arlington's historic sites? Well, something came along that helped out. Suddenly, we had a real job. The Battle Road Scenic Byway at Pick. The Uncle Sam Memorial statue is a resource. We volunteered for the tourism group. Now was the time to bring back the real Sam Wilson. To manage the Battle Road, the Board of Selectmen created the Byway Tourism and Development Committee. We applied for the tourism group and $500 for a logo design to start the process of introducing Sam Wilson and establishing his part. Instead, town meeting told the new committee had made the Uncle Sam Committee superfluous. The $500 is rejected by both the selectmen and the finance committee. Town meeting wasn't having any of that. With spirited opposition from Elsie Fiore and the late Dick Smith, our funding was approved. Uncle Sam got $500. Well, now we had something to work on. The federally funded byway was supposed to open at 212. It follows Massachusetts Avenue running right through Arlington. Your Uncle Sam committee attended every MAPC tourism meeting, the only independent town committee in four towns to do so. Our town had twice the representation, but we needed it. Elegant signs and unknown resources still can't make them familiar. But all tourists know Uncle Sam. We have to tell everyone the story of Un young Sam Wilson. Our challenge, transform Uncle Sam's statue into a historic site celebrating the colonial history of Sam Wilson. The statue area is a focal point. Visitors' information at Uncle Sam Plaza before there was a plaza. Town meeting 11, it, more than a statue. Our new logo was unveiled. We distributed so far about 100 buttons. I was not invited to appear on American Idol. <laughs> well, anyway, we said it's time for Uncle Sam Plaza. Everybody passes this spot, so many attractions. Sadly, the battle road was put on ice, no money. 
Well, the selectmen liked the idea. We had the tent, the banner, and now buttons. So we were there for town day again. We even had a Ted Palooza to help out. Now, we had a second tourism survey. Everyone liked Uncle Sam Plaza. Committee members got to work with public works to start fixing the place up. The first thing is get a little light on that statue. Uncle Sam Plaza was gaining momentum. At this point, we had cost the town about $850 for three and a half years, but we finally knew how to approach the Finance Committee. Lexington Minuteman was sort of nice, and Jefferson Cutter was sort of nice, but we were working on it. Mike Rodemaker gave us a lot of help. And meanwhile, with the byway on hold, the committee renamed itself ATED. In March, a $20,000 proposal to identify four historic Arlington sites was passed by the Finance Committee. Finally, Uncle Sam was included in byway signage. Thank you, ATED. Um, but since none of the featured sites had heard about the proposal, we were concerned about being part of the process. Town meeting responded with an amendment to make sure uh, that we, things were done in consultation with the four organizations related to the statues. But we were happy. Finally, Uncle Sam joins historic byway sites. Or did he? See Article 41. We may need your help again. By town day, the lighting was ready. Public Works didn't charge the lights. On Uncle Sam's birthday, we served hundreds of cupcakes and ice cream snacks. From 2008 to 2013, and less than $2,000, we're moving along. Every time we get there, Mr. Donnelly shows up. <laughs> At any rate, 2013, well, this is about last year. We explained we had to tell the story. A. Ted and town meeting had voted and funded the historic Arlington Uncle Sam Memorial statue sign. But nobody can read the base. Uncle si other sites have places for brochures. So we located the official Massachusetts Historic Site people. Now every visitor will know the whole story. Town Day 213, Uncle Sam Plaza opens with a huge vote of thanks to Ted Peluso and A. Ted, who did a magnificent job of orchestrating this whole thing. Com committee member Elsie Fiore participated in the dedication of the, of the statue. So we're really pleased she was part of this one too. The local media covered it, the choir sang, proclamations were proclaimed, dedications were dedicated, and Sean Garbley does the honors at a new historic site opens. Yay, well, politicians love this. But there's more. <laughs> Most people don't know that Sam Wilson, who aided the Sons of Liberty and was a drummer boy, was woken up that morning by Paul Revere who was rousing his father and his brother. His father was a son of liberty, and his brother was, in fact, um, a Minuteman. As a matter of fact, little Sam, he did some messenger uh, running for uh, Dr. Warren, and he was uh, bringing the news back from Bunker Hill. He was quite involved. But we've got to do something to make the world know. So, a new historic Arlington tradition, as Paul Revere meets young Uncle Sam Wilson again. There he is. He was saying, good to see you after all this time. Oh, it's Ken Donnelly again. Um, <laughs> with the tip of the tricorn to Zarita Menem, to on our committee, Joe Curl, with the flag, A. Ted, and Ted Cogia, the first young Sam Wilson, uh, and, our, uh, and our Uncle Sam Button model over there. And there's more. <laughs> after 15 years of being dedicated to establishing an Uncle Sam Day for September 13, it looks like it's finally going to happen. Uncle Sam was forgotten, but she brought him back. Thank you, town meeting, and everyone who gave us a hand when we needed it. This took five years at a total cost of under $5,000 for everything you've seen, because it was all done by us and by you. With a final salute to Dick Smith, who did so much for Arlington, and who stood up for us when we needed it the most. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Mark. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Marr, uh, Precinct 14 Chairman of the Cable Advisory Committee. Uh, as you all know, there are three cable providers in town, Comcast, Verizon, and RCN. The Comcast license is due to expire in July of 2016. The RCN license September 2016 and the uh, Verizon license in March of 2017. One might question why Mara is standing up talking about things that are going to happen two years hence or over two years. Actually, the process is federally ordained by the Cable Consumer Protection Act of 1992 and the Telecommunications Act of 1996. 
The process has begun by receipt of what I call Section 626 letters from the cable providers. We, are, we have received those. Um, and the next step in the process, which begins between 30 and 36 months before the expiration, is what is called the ascertainment period. And that is about to get underway next month. Ascertainment is a process uh, which, by which stakeholders, uh, members of town meeting, members of the general viewing public, Council on Aging, uh, the uh, elderly uh, community, uh, department heads, certainly local access, have an opportunity to talk about the performance of the three cable providers for the last uh, number of years and to talk about what they, uh, respective stakeholders would like to see in uh, the upcoming licenses. Uh, there this will be uh, a very transparent process. Uh, it will be duly advertised. Uh, I'd certainly be glad to hear from any of you uh, during the course of this uh, process. We'll probably be receiving a survey from the committee. The committee's sole reason for existence is to support the Board of Selectmen. The Board of Selectmen is the licensing authority of the town, and we also take direction from the town manager. Um, <clears throat> members of the committee are myself, uh, David Good, uh, the town's director of uh, technology, uh, Michael Quinn, uh, sitting in the back there, uh, is a town meeting member, and Joseph Weiss. Uh, there's Michael over there. Uh, there is a vacancy on the committee. Uh, we'd be very glad to have anybody who's interested in serving uh, provide a resume and letter of interest to the selectman's office uh, with a copy to the town manager's office. Uh, it will be, uh, at the end of the ascertainment process, the town puts together our, essentially what they would like to see in a license, the cable, respective cable providers respond, uh, and negotiations ensue. Uh, if uh, I did participate uh, a number of years for each of the uh, prior years for the uh, three licenses, they, they can be contentious. Uh, we're big boys and girls out here. I think we know what we're we're about. I, uh, the licenses that we have in existence now, I think, are very well regarded uh, by other communities. We anticipate that will be no less the case in our hopefully successful negotiations. So uh, we'll keep the, the uh, uh, town meeting advised. And again, strongly encourage anybody who would like to serve to uh, submit a uh, resume letter, <coughs> excuse me, letter of interest to the selectman, a copy to the town manager, and I'm available to do, uh, talk to anybody about other activities of the committee. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for your committee work. Um, any other committee reports? Ms. Barron. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'm Sherry Barron, Precinct 7, and I'm a member of the Arlington Human Rights Commission. And it is my honor to present the Arlington Human Rights Commission 2013 Annual Report. Before I go on, I would like to point out the commissioners in here who are also town meeting members. So if you would just wave when I call your name. Christine Carney and Douglas Davidoff. Thank you. Um, we are very pleased to tell you that as of January of this year, we entered our 20th year as the Human Rights Commission. 19 years ago, we sat in this room, I think it was June, and over the course of two nights, we discussed the pros and cons of establishing a Human Rights Commission. It took passionate, articulate stories from a number of community members who had been victims of human rights violations to convince the majority of town meeting that a human rights commission would benefit our community, and I believe it has. The Arlington Human Rights Commission has a twofold mission, to investigate complaints arising from human rights violations and to educate and raise awareness of the benefits of living in a diverse community and illustrate the often devastating effects of intolerance and bigotry. Through the 20 years, it has been an honor and privilege to serve with so many remarkable, dedicated, 
truly good people, both on the Commission and community residents. Each of you has sacrificed to make the world a better place. You, by your existence and voices, are ambassadors for justice, fairness, equity, and peace. And the Arlington Human Rights Commission thanks you for that. I would be remiss if I did not thank some very special people who have also been our allies for 20 years. Our gratitude goes to the Finance Committee for continuing our funding, the Board of Selectmen and School Committee who support us by exemplifying respect for the diversity of our town every day, our town manager, Adam Chapdelaine, who very early on in his tenure as town manager came to one of our meetings and offered us his complete support. We thank you for that. And most especially, our police department. Where is he? I know he's here. Um, for the open, collaborative relationship we have always enjoyed. We work closely with the police department, and our relationship is the result of having Chief Frederick Ryan at the helm. Chief Ryan often calls upon us to discuss and to collaborate on the best ways to handle incidents. We are very lucky in Arlington to have a stalwart supporter of human rights in our police chief. I'd like to thank him and his staff for their support through the years. If you were here, I would give him applause. So what have we been doing the past year? Um, you can read about us in the annual report. If you've not yet gotten to page 62, I'll tell you a little bit about what we've been doing. We initiated a response coordination team that will act in a timely manner to determine the course of unified action with the goal of preserving civil discourse and behavior in the Arlington community. And this committee is made up of uh, Nancy Rhodes, who's one of our commissioners, the Human Rights Commission will serve as chair for this committee. And on the committee will, will be the police chief, the superintendent of schools, the town public information officer, um, and representatives of the school committee, board of selectmen, the diversity task group of Vision 2020, and local clergy. We continue to update our website to increase user friendliness and accessibility, and our website is www.arlingtonhumanrights.org. On this past Sunday, May 4th, nearly 70 people came to the Whittemore Robbins House to celebrate the 10th anniversary of marriage equality legislation in Massachusetts, and it was a wonderful afternoon. We continue to support the Martin Luther King Jr. celebration and other human rights events related other human rights related events as our budget allows. We donated 10 children's books to the William Shea Memorial Library at the Thompson School in honor of our past commissioner Bill Shea. We donated 10 books to the Robbins Memorial Library in honor of another past member, Nancy Sweeney. We purchased the film Misrepresentation and a set of curriculum that focuses on media portrayals of women and how they influence and affect young people. We hosted an event showing this film this past April and we've donated the film and the curriculum to the school system. We have permanently established a school liaison program so that each school um, has a commissioner attached to it and we've sought to go out and speak to each principal, let, letting them know who we are and how they can use us. Um, and we are trying to get on the agenda of school councils and PTO meetings so that we can do the same thing. Uh, one of our, our problems, I, th I know, has been over the past 20 years is that there are just too many people who don't know that we exist. And we are, have been here as an insurance policy, a place to turn to for those who feel their human rights have been violated. I'm very proud of our accomplishments. 
Our goals for 2014, as we move ahead, is, are to continue the school liaison program, sponsor a viewing of the film Rescue in the Philippines, and a discussion with the film producer, participate in Town Day, which we've done for 20 years, increase collaboration with relevant town groups, and expand outreach to other community groups, and hold two dialogues hopefully focusing on human rights related issues. We're looking forward to a very productive year. On a more somber note, um, I just want to say, I mean, I think town meeting knows that we've lost Bill Shea. Bill was a, 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 an original member of the commission. Last summer, we lost Nancy Sweeney. Excuse me who had been on the commission for about seven years. And then several weeks ago, our administrative assistant died, um, Marilyn Carnell. We will miss all of them. And I ask for you to join me in a moment of silence. If you'd like any information about the Human Rights Commission, there are brochures on the back table, and I urge you each to take one. Even if you never read it, keep it handy so that if you need it, or more so, if you know someone who needs it, you can hand it to them. Um, what happens, I believe, is that people who need us are sometimes the least likely to come to us. Um, it may be because of their being new to town, maybe for any number of reasons. Um, and it's very, very important to help them make that step. And we hope that you will do that. We also have a phone number. We have an office phone number, 781-316-3250, which is on our brochure. And just to end, I want to thank you for your continued support. For some of you, this might be the first time you've ever heard of us. Please feel free to come to our meetings. They're the third Wednesday of the month at 8 o'clock, and I believe they're going to continue to be at the Jefferson Cutter House on the ground level, enter from the back. We're here if you or someone you know needs us. And I will end with this. Margaret Mead said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barron. Thank your committee. <laughs> Any other reports of committees? Seeing none, Mr. Tosti. I move that Article 3 be laid upon the table. All in favor of laying Article 3 upon the table, please say yes. yes. Opposed? Article 3 is upon the table. Mr. Tosti. Move that uh, the town meeting take up the special town meeting, Article 5, on uh, money for the fire station. Uh, Article 5 of the special town meeting is moved now before us. Ladies and gentlemen, as, as uh, Mr. Cole said, uh, the bids have come in on the fire station uh, on or under budget. Therefore, Article 5 can go with the original recommendation of the Finance Committee uh, of no action. We don't need a second it. It's already in force. We have before us a recommended vote of no action on Article 5 of the special town meeting. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? It's a unanimous vote of no action. So declare it. Tosti? Can you please uh, Mr. Moderator, I move that Article 1 be taken from the table. Article 1 is uh, all in favor? Yes. All opposed? Article 1 is now before us. I move that the special town meeting be dissolved. All in favor of dissolving the special town meeting of 2014, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? The meeting is dissolved. Ladies that and gentlemen, um, brings us to Article 28, Mr. Tosti, of the regular annual meeting. Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to move to take uh, to table Article 28 for just a couple of minutes to take up Article 29. Article 29 is the appropriation for the Board of Assessors for revaluation. If you remember a question like that, a question came up 
and the assessors were, were not here uh, to answer it. I talked to the assessors uh, over the weekend. Uh, one of the assessors is, is uh, in, in rehab. Uh, the other assessor was not available, so Mr. Doherty said that he would be available uh, today, but not Wednesday, uh, to take any questions. Therefore, I move that Article B-28 be laid upon the table so we can take up Article 29. All in favor of laying Article 28 upon the table, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? Article 28 is on the table. That brings us to Article 29. We have, of course, recommended vote of the Finance Committee of $10,000. Mr. Jamison. Thank you, Mr. Mon Thank you, Mr. Monterey. Gordon Jamison, presenting 12. Um, yes, I did rise at the previous meeting to ask a question of the um, Board of Assessors or the Assessors. Um, and I was disappointed, and I understand there are cir circumstances, uh, mitigating circumstances, but I did speak with the past chair at, uh, on, <laughs> while holding signs out in front of the bracket and said that I was disappointed last year when an article came up that no one from the assessor's office or the board was here to answer a question. So I think it's very important, you know, um, that Mr. Toste and the town manager um, and school committee um, Many of those members and department heads are here for every meeting, and even when their department is not um, specifically involved in the night's uh, action. Uh, the clerk is here, the treasurer is here, the other independent offices are represented every night on the floor of town meeting. I think it's important that the assessors take town meetings seriously and uh, make an effort to be here, especially when um, their articles come up so we can ask questions, hopefully before we have to get up and ask questions on the floor. So my question the other night was, um, we're appropriating $10,000 now. We did this once before when I was a member, and I want to know what the future costs are, which were alluded to in the um, report from the Finance Committee, what the future costs for this, uh, the full reassessment will be. Thank you. Assessor James Doherty. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Town Meeting, for taking this out of order. Um, <clears throat> before I make my comments, I would just ask that all of you, uh, Kevin Feely, the Chairman of the Board of Assessors, long-serving um, member of our board, former selectman in town, uh, lifetime, uh, lifetime Allentonian, um, <clears throat> was unable to be here. He went in for knee surgery a few weeks ago, and uh, as a, a gentleman just getting into his uh, golden years, he had some complications and uh, <clears throat> he would have cherished to be here tonight. I can assure you him, as well as the other two members of the Board of Assessors, have the utmost respect for town meeting. We do our uh, darnest to make it here. Uh, I myself have been a town meeting member up to last year for over 24 years, so I have spent a great deal of time on this floor, as have the other members. Um, it was unfortunate last week that we weren't here. It was no slight to this body whatsoever. We actually happened to be um, <clears throat> meeting with some members, uh, taxpayers, who had uh, questions about their assessments and, um, and time got away from us, so I apologize for that. Having said that, um, many of you um, are aware that we are required by state law to do a revaluation once every three years. In addition to that, we have to do interim annual adjustments to the, um, the assessed values. On these three-year cycles, um, we do use, as most communities do, some outside assistance. In our particular case, we have engaged, we've had a long-standing relationship uh, with Patriot Properties. They're the preeminent revaluation company in the, in the state, um, and they work actively nationally as well. Um, as your material is pointed out in the FinCom report, we are requesting $10,000 in this year's budget, in addition, next year, because it will go over 14 and 15, the, uh, 15 and 16, um, we are requesting, well, we will be requesting next time an additional 10,000. So that will give us $20,000 for this revaluation, in addition to the 19,000 that we have had incumbent to assist in that. We will be working with the FinCom committee over the next couple of years to get a stabilized um, <clears throat> appropriation, hopefully on an annual basis. 
This uh, negates the necessity, as many of you know who have been here for a while, uh, we have peaks and valleys depending on the requirements of the DOR, Department of Revenue. Um, there are some years where the high watermark on those appropriations can go upwards of $700,000 uh, because we're required once every nine years to go out and canvass the entire town. This year is um, considered to be more of a mathematical statistical type update, so we don't, it's not that labor intensive. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, so this is not the heavy duty um, reassessment, Mr. Daugherty. This is, yeah, that's correct. This is the light one. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Harrington. Stephen? Yes. Mr. Klein? Moderator Christian Klein, Precinct 10. Does the reassessment include a reevaluation of the number of units in buildings, and particularly residential units that are supposed to have a maximum of two? Mr. Doherty? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, this particular reevaluation uh, does not include a complete canvassing of the town, so unless something um, came to our attention that would warrant us to go to a um, particular group, particular neighborhood, anything like that. We will not be going to door to door this year. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Mr. McCabe? I'm Mark McCabe, Precinct 2. I move to terminate debate on Article 29 and all matters before it. Motion to terminate debate on Article 29 and all matters before us. So all in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? It is a two-third vote, and I so declare it. We have before us to recommend a vote of the Finance Committee to $10,000 for the assessors. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. It is a unanimous vote, and I so declare it. That brings us back to Article 28. Ladies and gentlemen, I move that Article B 20, 28 be taken from the table. Did Mr. Did you want to do your thing? Yeah. After, after Alan? Okay, I just want to make a couple comments before we start the, the budgets. Uh, number one, uh, we, we always try to have this sort of mistake free, but I suppose 17 pages or 18 pages of financial numbers will generate at least one. So if you can go to B9, B9. Police services. And if you look down under detail of personal services under police services, you get down to patrolmen and it has 49, 47, 47, 49. That last 49 is a mistake. It should be 47. So for these, uh, for the last two years and next year, we will have 47 patrolmen. So that 49 was a mistake. Please change that. And just the, the reason for the increase, substantial increase in the patrolmen uh, is that's basically three years of salary increases uh, I think it's of three, 2.75, 2.75 that all got rolled into that uh, since contracts were, were just settled. So uh, it is 47 patrolmen, not 49. As you go through the budget, you'll see increases on most of the people. Keep in mind for fiscal uh, 15, next fiscal year, there is a 2.75% cost of living built in. And for those people that haven't reached, there could also be a step increase in that. Uh, so that accounts for probably 90% of the increases. Uh, and the Finance Committee uh, stands ready to try to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Mr. Jones. Uh, you want me to start, huh? <laughs> All right, well, I'm gonna start from here, if that's okay. So. Uh, Annie LaCourt, Precinct 15. Alan, you want to? Alan Jones, Precinct 14, and member of the Finance Committee. Uh, so you're probably wondering why we're standing up here. We want to talk to you a little bit about the Arlington Visual Budget. 
which is another way that you can get some information about the budget that we think might help with your decision making tonight. I'm just going to briefly tell you a little bit about how the visual budget came to be and then um, what the point is and then we'll do a quick demo, take any questions and hopefully be done with this because I know we're all wanting to get to the end at this point. Um, so a um, little over a year ago in March, I was doing some work um, over at Involution Studios, which is a local um, uh, software development company. And I turned to the principal of the company and I said, I need you to do something for me for free. I need you to create a visualization of Arlington Town's budget. And he thought about it for about 30 seconds and said, sure. And then I called up Adam's office. And I forget whether I talked to Adam or I talked to Andrew, but whoever I talked to when I said, so I got a guy and he says, we'll do this, what do you think? I got the second quickest answer I've ever gotten to a question, which was, sure, we'd love that. And hence, we went about um, putting together a team to build the visual budget. Um, the principal folks who worked on this were Mike Booten, who's sitting over there next to Alan and David, who is the business budget analyst. Say it again. Management analyst um, in the town uh, manager's office. And he worked a lot with Alan. Um, I, having put this all together, then became so swamped at work, I couldn't even get to meetings for six months. And when I got back there, they'd put together this great visual tool. And all I've done ever since then is sort of show for it. Um, so I want to congratulate Alan and Mike and also the folks over at Involution Studio who pro bono built this tool um, and paid a great deal of attention to its design and its usability. The point of this tool is to create greater transparency um, for the residents of the town of Arlington and for you to give you a different way of looking at the budget that will answer some of the questions that I think we sometimes struggle with here, which is sort of, you know, what is the relative, I don't know, effect of certain parts of the budget and are we putting our money where our values are? What's important to me about this visualization is that it shows you what we value because it shows you the size of things in the budget. Uh, so without further ado, we'll run through a quick demo for you, and you can get at this tool to inform your own decision making anytime you want, and you can recommend it to your friends and neighbors when they have questions about how we budget in Arlington. So we're starting here on the expenses page. If you look across the top of the screen, which hopefully you can see well, you'll see that it says revenues, expenses, and funds, and um, reserves. Those are the three pages in the tool. And then on each page of the tool, um, since on the start page, there's a place to put in your annual tax contribution. You will see at the top of this main page what your annual tax contribution is, the size of the proposed budget, um, the average budget over the last few years, and the increase of the budget over let this year over last year, just some basic information. And then there's two graphics. The one graphic that Alan's playing with right now is a trending tool, which shows you the trend of parts of the budget over time from 2008 to 2019, which is the end of the current five-year plan. And then you have what we call the tree map, which shows you the relative size of parts of the budget. And then there's, in addition to this map view, there's a tabular view. Alan, if you want to just quick flip to the tabular view, and then we'll come back. So for those of you who are text-based like me, you can come here instead and get a list and a little um, trend line and uh, see the effect on the budget and drill down into this. But most people are going to want to look at the map view. If we go back to the map view. Okay. And here on this page, what happens if you go to one of the blocks of, this, of the map view here and click on it, you will drill down to the next level. Um, this is the town departments, and if you drill down from here into, say, public works, then you begin to see how our public works money is distributed. And the most interesting part of this budget, if you drill into it, is what we spend on snow and ice. You see all those bumps? You can tell what the weather was by looking at them. Um, interesting thing here is that you will see that your contribution to the budgeted amount for snow removal this year is $32. If you go back and you look at, say, 2011, and the numbers travel with you, you'll see that in a bad year, the average contribution is about 90 bucks or slightly less than it would cost for me to have a professional um, plow out my driveway. Um, so if we go back up to the main page on expenses again, Alan, if you don't mind, all the way, 
You, if you scroll over this page, you will see that there's included a tooltip that shows what your contribution to each section of the budget is. And on some of these, like um, the MWRI debt shift, you can see that there's additional information that explains the obscure terms that we sometimes use when talking about the budget. Um, if you go and you look at the insurance budget, you'll see another interesting uh, piece of information here, which is that um, we have, you can see the effect of going into the GIC. We have sort of had a dip and our trend is much flatter than it used to be. Okay, if we go from here to the revenue page, okay, are we getting there? You'll see a similar um, block diagram of where our money comes from. You learn some interesting things by digging into this. If you dig into, for example, uh, where are you headed, Alan? You're headed into state aid or local receipts? If you dig into local receipts, you'll see that funny little bump there. If you dig down into licenses and permits, now you can tell when it was that we permitted SIMS. Um, so it's interesting to walk through here if you know the numbers, but I think it's also interesting for residents to be able to walk through because it shows them some things about um, what has happened over time. If you go and you look at funds and revenues, which is the last thing that I'm gonna show you, um, then you begin to see that here in funds and reserves, the effect of the override. The dark blue at the bottom of the trend line that is the override stabilization fund. Spend down, add up, spend down again. Okay? And then if you back out from this, you'll see that dark orange line in there. That is the tip fee stabilization fund. And you can see how we spent that down to zero and no longer have it. Um, interesting piece of history. And then finally, another thing that becomes obvious from this particular view, if you look at the dark green line, which is the free cash line, you can again see the effect that going into the GIC had on free cash the year that we budgeted that amount of money and it gave us a big boost in our free cash reserve, um, which will make a difference to how long it is before we do another override. Um, We've got to wrap it up. Yeah, uh, the only other thing we were going to talk about is sort of what we're going to do next, but uh, it depends upon the indulgence of the meeting, I guess. Well, quickly. Well, thank you. I do want to point out this is open source code. Uh, you can go to GitHub and find the code. The data this is driven is all there. Uh, part of the links we didn't show is where the data comes from, whether it comes from the you know town of Arlington or whatever. Uh, this won an award at the Mass Municipal, or the town of Arlington, our town, won an award at the Mass Municipal Association uh, last year. Ever since then, we've been getting a lot of phone calls from towns as far as California, uh, Asheville, North Carolina, Arlington, Virginia, and Grafton, Massachusetts to put it up themselves. Uh, we've been getting uh, a, a ton of suggestions on what to do with the thing. We want to add debt ser borrowing and debt service. Those are important parts of the budget. Drill down in deeper levels of detail, add enterprise funds, CDBG, CBA, all of those. Uh, a lot of people have asked for comparisons from uh, you know, projections versus actuals versus budgets. Uh, per capita, per household numbers, things like that, add comparables. We want to move it to a platform that makes it easier for people out there to add plugins and modules to expand the use of it. So this is just getting started. We've got a lot more stuff to do, insurmountable opportunities. Thank you. Now, wait, where Thank do we you. find this magic tool? ArlingtonVisualBudget.org. Is there a link on the town web page to that? Somewhere? Yes. Where? Yes. Yeah, there is a link on the, on the town web page somewhere. Google for it. You'll get thousands of hits. Mm -hmm. Oh, it'll be on Google. If you have any Adam, questions or suggestions, wait. please talk to one of us. Adam's yes, going to tell us where it is in the town website. Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. If you go to arlingtonma.gov slash budgets, uh, there'll be a link to this site as well as other financial information. Okay, thank you. Thank All you. Right, so, thank you very much. Thank you both for your work on that. We're going to handle the budgets um, as we have in the past several years. I'm going to go through each budget individually. If someone wishes to discuss that budget, yell out hold. We'll go through all the budgets. The ones that are held, we'll address those budgets on a piecemeal basis, one at a time. That way we can have a good discussion on each budget, individual budget and get it done with it once, as opposed to jumping all around between all the different budgets. So I'm going to start off with the Finance Committee. If someone wants to discuss that, they yell hold. So Finance Committee. Okay. We're all happy with that. Board of Selectmen. 
We're all happy with them. Town manager. Hold. Hold. Human resources. Information technology. Comptroller. Treasure collector. Postage. Board of Assessors. Legal. Town Clerk. Board of Registrars. Parking. Planning and Community Development. Redevelopment Board. Zoning Board of Appeals. Public Works. Community Safety. Inspections. Education. Libraries. Health and Human Services. Retirement. Insurance. Reserve Fund. Water and Soar. Recreation. It, wait. Oh, wait a second. I'm into appendixes. Uh, we usually don't go into those. Well, we'll go through them in case someone wants to talk about them. Ed Burns Arena. <laughs> Council on Aging. Youth Services. Hold. Okay. Now we go back to the beginning. Someone wanted to discuss the town manager. Mr. Fuller. Peter Fuller, Precinct 20. This is not really a town manager question, but the moderator informed me I could ask it here. Um, way at the back of the report, Appendix C, Summary of Recommendations. Down on the lower right, Summary of Expenditures, there's an item Sims Urban Renewal, $677,750. Um, last year, in the past few years, this has only been $100,000. Um, this is debt service, I presume, for the town's purchase of the Sims site. So I have three questions. Why the increase? What's the revenue source for paying it? And when does the debt go away? Mr. Tosti is going to address your questions, Mr. Fuller. Thank you. The uh, 675000 and change uh, in C is for debt service for the bonds for the uh, purchase of the Sims property. The Sims property is under an Urban Renewal Act, state law. Uh, in regards to that, in order to pay debt service, the first amount of money that's available from property taxes from Sims goes automatically to, into the Urban Renewal to pay the debt service. The reason it's been about 100000 over the last couple of years is because that's all the property tax we were earning on Sims. This year, with the development of Sims, as you can see up on the hill, the, the property tax has increased fairly substantially. So the first 675000 and change of that property tax goes immediately to pay the debt service. That's the total debt service. Anything over that just goes into the general fund. We had to put it some places and is showing as an expenditure because otherwise it wouldn't balance uh, on that. So that's, that's the purpose for it. Uh, the money goes directly there for debt service. The debt service will be retired in 2022. Thank you, very informative. I 
I just wanted to air it out to inform our new members and refresh the memories of the rest of us. And thank you, Mr. Moderator, for allowing me to ask the question. Thank you, Mr. Fuller, and thank you for contacting me in advance to discuss that. Um, anyone else wish to discuss the town manager's budget? Seeing none, we're going to move on. Someone wanted to discuss the treasurer collector. Mr. Harrington. Stephen Harrington, Precinct 13. Um, this is a general comment first. If you look at these budgets, um, or, or the budget book, we're looking at past budgets. And that's not good financial reporting. We should be looking at actual numbers. Lexington, if you look at their budget book, shows actual numbers. When a budget's done, a budget is a plan for the future. When a budget's done, you never look back to see what you've done for a budget. And I called out this one in particular because it highlights exactly this problem. If you look at the treasurer's budget under the deputy treasurer, who we all met tonight, seems like a nice guy. But if you look back for the past four years, there's been an appropriation for a deputy treasurer. And at least for two of those that I know of, we had no deputy treasurer. So to compare a budget number that we're planned for the future, for the next fiscal year, to last year's budget, which is a made up number, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So that brings up a question, Mr. Moderator, I'd like to know where did that, what is it, $69,000 and change, where did that go? Mr. Gilligan, our town treasurer. Sorry, Steve. Do you understand the gentleman's question? I do, Mr. Moderator. Stephen Gilligan, town treasurer. In order to fill a vacancy, the salary must be budgeted. Uh, I had attempted to fill that vacancy over the last several years. In order to do that, town meeting has to vote the salary for that budget. Uh, where that money has not been used, uh, it was utilized either to avoid a transfer because of overtime and or returned to the general fund, turned back to the town. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. And answer your question, sir. Yes, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Gilligan. So these types of things are spread out throughout this financial report. And a financial report really should um, make things clear. And so when you see a number, you know, like this. What's that? Oh, you're done? Mr. Okay. Mr. Tosti, you have the floor. Please come in, shake your seats. Quiet in the hall, Mr. Tosti has the floor. Okay, um, in, in response to Mr. Harrington, uh, when I became chairman of the committee. Point of order. What's your point of order, sir? Yes, I'm trying to get the control of the members. Not too much luck. Okay, um, just a couple comments in response to the uh, comments by Mr. Harrington. Uh, w when I became uh, chairman, what seems like 100 years ago, uh, we actually did that. Um, if you go back and you look at the early 90s to the uh, about three or four years of finance committee reports, it was budget, budget, actual, actual. And um, what I found was, after three or four years of doing this, th three things. Number one, it was a tremendous amount of work to do that. Uh, to get all that done in the Finance Committee report uh, for a volunteer board. Secondly, it created a tremendous amount of confusion on, uh, in town meeting because, you know, of, the, of actuals versus budget. Uh, and, and it just, after a while, I, I, we just gave up and, and went back to budgets. Uh, and, and I think that the budgets are actually better because the budget is, is what you vote. The budget is the values of the town uh, the, the, uh, and the town meeting as far as what monies you allocate towards a budget. Actuals 
uh, you know, really don't give you that much information. Uh, now we get, the Finance Committee gets uh, the budgets from the town meeting that, that contain all of that. The actuals uh, contains all the individuals and everything uh, on that. Um, and so we do go through all of that. But when it comes to you looking across the line at, a, at an expense item, I, I think it's, um, it, it, it's more reasonable, and people have told me this, to look at what we actually voted as opposed to what the actual was two or three years ago. Um, another thing is that um, we, we don't beat up on department heads for not spending money. Uh, that's the worst thing you can do. Because uh, if you beat up on department heads for not spending money and ask them all kinds of questions, next year they will make sure that all the money is spent. Uh, and we're trying not to do that. So we try to say thank you very much for not spending the money and then we Alec, go over the budgets and see if we can get a little bit less and, and, uh, and go through that process. So um, we did do that. Uh, it, it really didn't work out very well. Uh, and, the, and having the actual budgets that you have voted uh, to compare next year's budget with seems to have worked out better. Now, at some point, the, you have the town manager's financial plan, which is on the website. And that does have actuals in it. So if you want to look at that, it does have the actuals. It doesn't have the detail that the Finance Committee report does, but it does have actuals there. At some point in the future, I know the manager is looking to, be more, to be, have a more explicit detailed uh, set um, to go on the website, but he, he's not there yet. Uh, so I hope that explains why we're doing it the way we do. Thank you. Thank you. Is it Ms. Yep. Ms. LaCourt had her hand up. We're still in the treasurer's budget, correct? Yes. Annie LaCourt, Precinct 15. Mr. Moderator, will you indulge me to continue along Mr. Harrington's theme and ask a few questions about, no, <laughs> not of Mr. Harrington Mr. necessarily. Harrington. Um, in other words, more general questions about how we present the budget rather than just on the treasurer collector? Yeah, I, yeah, I guess, but. Thank you. I promise to be brief. Okay. Okay. So um, I'd like to point out, not trying to toot my own too much, but that if you go look at the data on the Arlington visual budget, that all the past data is actual data. So you can certainly the see the actual budgeted or actual spent. Actually spent. Okay, thank you. In the budget categories. And of course the audited financials, which tell you exactly what happened and what the auditors say we actually did, are available. But perhaps the town manager could talk for 10 seconds, 15 seconds, about the upcoming project, which is the open checkbook. Okay, but then we're going to get back to budgets. Yes, sir. Thank you. Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. Um, what Ms. LaCour is referring to is a concept called open checkbook that the Commonwealth has used for the past couple years, which would allow someone to go in and query all expenditures in the town budget, both salary uh, and expenditure-wise. Uh, from department levels, uh, personnel level, and find out exactly what was spent uh, in any number of given fiscal years. So we received a grant through the state uh, to work with Munis, our accounting software, to provide that uh, as a, as a, a web-based interface and should ha start working on that in the next couple of months. So by this time next year, that should be a tool available. Thank you. Thank you for your indulgence, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, now we all understand that. Anyone else want to talk about the Treasurer's budget? Seeing none. Uh, Someone wanted to talk about the Board of Assessors. Mr. Harrington. Stephen Harrington, Precinct 13. I won't do a sales job. On the Board of Assessors last year, Mr. Moderator, uh, we had asked a question. Uh, there was a volunteer in the town who had given a, um, an extremely good property search tool. And I've talked to that volunteer, and um, the only reason that he doesn't do it anymore is because the assessors won't provide it. And last year when we asked this question about you know, Patriot Properties, the provider of assessment services to the Board of Assessors, provides a really poor tool. Uh, this individual provided a really good tool. And um, it wasn't a question of either or, it really was just a question of releasing the public information so that residents of Arlington could look at properties um, in a very good way. And so uh, my question, Mr. Moderator, is um, last year the Board of Assessors said that they would uh, look into um, uh, 
providing the functionality of that tool. Um, I, I just want to know the status of it. Thank you. Mr. Doherty. The difference between the Patriot and the old. And thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you for clarifying uh, that. Um, the um, the person who was donating his time was donating his, donating his time to a multitude of departments. My understanding through conversations with the IT department, the town manager's department, was that some um, additional content was being contained on this um, uh, this site and um, citizens had expressed concerns about it and uh, based on some of those concerns and the, reluctant of the reluctance of the gentleman who I might add um, is a very capable, competent and um, <clears throat> great citizen for donating his time for many, many years. Um, it was sad to see him go but unfortunately um, it was one of those things that, that had occurred. Um, I would just uh, reiterate in terms of what we currently have out there, captures the same data, format may be different. Um, Patriot Properties, again, I will reiterate, is the preeminent revaluation firm in the state as well as uh, uh, provides its services nationally. And I would suggest to you that over 100 communities in the state um, must be uh, pleasantly pleased, including Arlington Board of Assessors, with um, with their software package. Thank you. So Patriot Properties has boards of assessors for clients. The tool that I talked about had residents of Arlington really as its intended audience. And that's the main difference. It was a tool that let you search cross-sectionally. It was a tool that let you look back in time. It had nothing but public data on it. There's no reason for the Board of Assessors to hold back that public data. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, sir. Mr. Ward, did you have a hand up? Oh, you wanted to respond? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I did have my hand up. Uh, yeah, well, as, as m m many of you know, I, I'm about the most incompetent person in the, in the world in, when it comes to computers. and and using the internet and, and uh, the, all that stuff in general. Fortunately, I have good help in my office and good help at home, uh, and they sort of almost guide my hand. But I used to be able to go to the assessor's website and, as Mr. Harrington was saying, uh, look up, you know, look up some address and, and there it was and how to get the assessment of this particular building. And, um, and I couldn't do it to save my life now. And, and, and other people have told me that they have the same problem. So I don't know, as Mr. Harrington suggested, Mr. Doherty said something that was very mysterious, just one of those things and a secret content or something. I don't know what he's talking about, but I, it's, it seems to me that um, it shouldn't be that secret from people, uh, computer illiterate people like me or any of you who wants to just go on his computer and, and push a few buttons and find out what the assessments are of his neighbors or whoever else it is that he's snoopy about. Thank you. Mr. Doherty, can we get the old system back? I'm not sure we need the old system back. I, I, I think maybe we need a little tutorial for people um, that, that may need assistance with it, which the Board of Assessors, again, takes very seriously. Uh, Patriot Property is a client of the citizens of this town as the Board of Assessors who are their duly elected representatives. We actually implement it and we take responsibility for the actions of Patriot Property and we uh, take very seriously our role of making sure we equitably disperse the levy that this body asks the town to raise every year. Let's be very clear for the prior speaker to the last speaker and the comment of the last speaker. There is no data that is being hidden from any taxpayer in this community. Every single bit 
of data on anyone's property in this town is available in the assessor's office for inspection at any time versus during business hours. The content contained on the prior site and the content contained on Patriot Properties hosted site is the same data. Maybe in a different format, but it is the same data. There is no data blocked out. I think, Mr. Moderator, for clarity about the change in, if you will, service providers, um, maybe Dave Good yeah. could speak he's, to that. He's next on the list. Thank you. Mr. Good? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. David Good, uh, Chief Technology Officer. Uh, the, the former version of the uh, assessor's tool uh, was uh, housed and uh, uh, maintained uh, by a citizen. Uh, we had discussions with this citizen uh, with offers to uh, lease and buy his tool. Uh, we came to a sort of a parting of ways when uh, the citizen uh, wanted to uh, advertise uh, on his site uh, to actually pay for the maintenance of the site. And uh, it, being a municipal site, we're not allowed to advertise. So we came to a parting of company. It, it was a pretty civil discussion. Unfortunately, I wish we, we could have kept the tool. Uh, we tried two or three different avenues. Uh, uh, but there is not data that's sort of not available data is available, it is just currently not displayed in the tool that we have. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification, sir. Mr. Schlickman. Paul Schlickman, Precinct 9, motion to terminate debate under this budget item. On Budget 9, Board of Assessors. Motion to terminate debate on Budget 9, Board of Assessors. It's been seconded. All in favor? Opposed? No. It is a two-thirds vote, and I saw to clear it. Um, and next budget that was on hold was Public Works 17. Who wishes to speak to Public Works? Mr. Trembley. Mr. Fiore. So, uh, Mr. Moderator, I'll be asking the annual question. Oh, uh, Ed Trembley, Precinct 19, sorry. Um, so how much salt did we use last year? <laughs> I've tried to give up salt. I have high blood pressure. It's, it's, it's really um, bad for us. You know, Mr. Rademacher, how much salt did we put in our roads and that slushy stuff you spread out? Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Michael Rademacher, Director of Public Works. Uh, we applied approximately 9,500 uh, ton of salt this past winter. The, the advocate said we had, had used, and, and this was uh, while we still had several snowstorms left, the advocate said we had, had used 11,000 tons. Um, I don't believe they were accurate. Ah, okay, very good. <laughs> um, so do you have any idea how much, we had a little snowstorm. It was, it was kind of a surprise because it had been warm and the uh, streets were warm and, and uh, it would rain. And then it snowed overnight, maybe a quarter of an inch or something. And, and, and we salted the town again. Uh, we didn't salt the entire town. In the middle of the night, about 2 or 3 o'clock, we had gotten reports of uh, several accidents within the town, and that usually triggers us to begin a salting operation of uh, main routes, the hills and towns. Um, later that day, before we even could finish, the, uh, the weather broke, sun came out, and we could stop operation. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, was, it, was, it was melted before the sun came up. I, I, being in snow and ice myself, went out and looked. But... Uh, so I, I, I've seen on some of the, uh, I think I've seen on the, some, uh, some of the, some tanks on the, uh, do we have, uh, are we starting to spread liquid de-icers now? Uh, no. I must be confused and I, I, I apologize. And, and uh, Mr. Moderator, these, uh, these accidents that happened, do we, uh, do we have any idea how fast the cars were going? No, I don't think Mr. Rodemucker hires accident no. reconstruction specialists. <laughs> But, but I guess that's, that's, the, uh, that's the, the point. You know, when it's snowing, it's, we need to be a little careful with driving. And as a taxpayer, how, many, how much does it cost us to salt the town? 
It depends on the per the storm. Amount. Per I, storm. I, I, I don't have the average in front of me. It varies it, well, from storm to storm. You know, in a, in a conversation I had with you a couple of months ago, I think you told me it, that it was uh, something like 900 tons to salt the entire town. I, it, again, it depends on the severity of the storm. Okay. Um, so, uh, so I mean, I, I don't mean I don't mean to uh, to I'm not trying to beat up public works. I'm, I'm really not. But I, I would like to to make the general public aware that we do use a lot of salt in town, and the salt really does eat up everything. I mean, it. it, it Damages the infrastructure in towns. It certainly eats your cars, and uh, and and perhaps if people use snow tires like they should, because you know nobody, not too many people go out uh, in in the winter in their, with their summer shoes on. Uh, maybe we could use a little less salt, and um, if people slowed down during snowstorms, because right, I I for one don't see the need to uh, spend a lot of money on salt so people can go their normal summertime speed. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Mr. Fiore? Peter Fiore, Precinct 2. I'm not up here to beat up public works. I'm up here to beat up the private contractors that do the snow removal. Uh, I had three questions about, about the uh, contractors. Um, one, what's, what's the hiring or selection process? I'm not looking for the job, but I'd like to know how they get it. Um, what kind of training, if any, do they get from the town? And what kind of active uh, supervision do they get during the storm from the town? You want to field that one, Mr. Rademacher? Uh, Michael Rademacher, Director of Public Works. There are a few factors uh, when we select a contractor. Uh, past performance being the first that we get many uh, repeat contractors in town and uh, we take them back only if we've been happy with their um, work in previous uh, years. Second, we do a thorough inspection of the equipment uh, contractors have to make sure that we feel it will withstand a winter's wor uh, uh, worth of abuse and use. Um, and as far as training goes, uh, it really, it's on the job. We look to see uh, how their performance is during the course of the winter. During storms, we, um, we, uh, we uh, uh, keep a few employees solely for the purpose of evaluating uh, the work of the subcontractors to make sure the streets are being plowed uh, and they're not missing certain areas and that the work is being performed to standards that we so desire. Great. Thank you. Mr. Harrington? Stephen Harrington, Precinct 13. I'll just draw your attention to the Public Works budget. Uh, the Water and Sewer Enterprise Fund is an offset of about a million dollars this year. Uh, that'll come up later. I just wanted to draw your attention to that now. Uh, Mr. Moderator, I have a couple questions. Sure. First, um, I notice under administration that we have an energy manager and a recycling coordinator. Now, the recycling coordinator is uh, one part-time, and, um, you know, it's, a, it's, it's seeing a 79% increase this year to a $51,000. And the energy manager is also seeing a double-digit 23% increase to $43,000. Now, if I look further into the DPW budget, I see that there's street lights and traffic signals and fire alarms, maintenance and electricity costs, and they're down about $38,000. But they don't offset the work of the recycling coordinator and the energy manager. And if I look at the budget for the uh, waste hauling, that's also up this year. Uh, it's up, you know, 7% or so. And if I look at uh, the presentation that the recycling group showed us, you know, we're sort of flattening out in terms of um, uh, our recycling and as far as our waste hauling goes. And so I just want to understand, Mr. Moderator, whether or not we've used 
um, the energy manager to reduce about $38,000 worth of you know, operating expenses and turn it into a fully loaded salaried position. And the same thing with the recycling coordinator. Why at this time when it seems that we're bottomed out on, it doesn't seem like they're gonna have the chance of actually earning um, uh, the increase what, that we spend on this position. And so um, I'd just like to see in the budget where that is, not so much you know, what could happen. So can someone point to me why we're increasing these two positions much more than it seems that they're saving us in the budget? Mr. Tosti is going to address that issue, sir. Um, let's take two of the positions. First, the energy manager. Um, this is not entirely Arlington. Uh, this energy manager is shared with the town of Bedford. Uh, so the energy manager, two-thirds of his salary and benefits are paid for by the town of Arlington, and one-third of the energy manager uh, salary and benefits is paid by the town of Bedford. Uh, so we share that, and I think that's a, that's a good example of trying to reach out and share certain facilities. And I think, obviously, with the... Uh, uh, the logic for increasing the hours there is to try to save more money down the road. Now, as far as the recycling coordinator, uh, the finance committee was concerned about this, so we called the, uh, we asked the town manager to appear and discuss the merits of the, uh, of the recycling coordinator. And basically, they were, uh, the manager and DPW were concerned that, that recycling was leveling off and that they needed to put some more efforts, some more resources into encouraging the recycling. And, and obviously, the more we can encourage recycling, the less money we have to pay for in the tip fee that goes up to uh, North Andover Incinerator. Uh, to partially compensate for some of the money, you will notice under the recycling fund offset above it, uh, $12,663 uh, was taken out of that budget and or out of that fund to help pay for some of the cost of the recycling coordinator. So uh, that's the reason for the increase in hours is simply down the road uh, to, uh, to save money. And like I said, the energy coordinator we, we share with the town of Bedford. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, sir. Mr. Fuller. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Peter Fuller, Precinct 20. Uh, two things. First, uh, I think the increase in the sanitation budget that the previous speaker brought up, you can explain a lot of that from the tip fee stabilization fund offset going away. Um, can you speak right into the mic? Yes. Pull it down closer to you. There you go. Yeah, I think that the tip fee stabilization fund going away explains a lot of the increase in sanitation expenses. Um, secondly, down the bottom of the page, under street lighting, if you look across the years from 2012, there's been a huge reduction in the cost of electricity. I guess this is from putting in the new LED street lights. So I applaud this saving, and are we going to see more savings in the future, or is uh, that conversion all finished? Adam, Ms. Chapdelaine, I'm sorry. Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. There may be some additional savings when we um, finally get a, a full 12-month uh, look at the actual street lights. We're also going to start looking at uh, LED light uh, installments in uh, town parking lots. Uh, we're also further looking at decorative light fixtures in the three business uh, centers for upgrades to LEDs. So there may be some small additional savings in future years. Oh, super. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. McKinney. In the interest of brevity, uh, uh, having the opportunity here, um, one of my motions had to do with the difficulty we had in finding some Christmas lights for the Uncle Sam Plaza. Uh, Laura Weiner and Ted Fields were kind enough to get in touch with me and ask if we could join First Light. And that was about three weeks ahead of time. We called and we were sent to one place and then we were sent to another place. You have all and then to a third place. 
And it went around several times. Now, the last time we needed lights, like for the Uncle Sam statue, uh, we actually put in for the money, and although we didn't get charged, it happened. Now, since uh, we have always had a fantastically good relationship with, with Mr. Rodemaker, and I have heard that this money and these lights may be available, if he can assure me that these lights will be available, I can withdraw that article and save us that much time. Um, Mr. Rodemaker, will Lo there be uh, lights available for Uncle Sam Plaza next Christmas? That's my duty to ask him the question. Oh, I Oh, Mr. Will the moderator please ask Mr. Rodemaker if there will be Will you lights? give him the lights under this budget so we can dispose of his other articles efficiently? Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Michael Rodemaker, yes, uh, we will do so. Thank you. We can, uh, we, I will withdraw that article and we'll have that much more time for town meeting. Thank Which you article much. is that? Which one? Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for your time. And I forgot to say, Lawrence McKinney, Precinct 7. Got to lose. Ms. Phelps. Mr. Leonard. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Leonard, Precinct 17, with a question uh, for Mr. Rodemaker, if I could, please. Over the years, uh, we've had trouble in regards to finding places to uh, place some of the snow that we've taken off of the streets. We've had it placed at Sims Hospital, which we know we can't do anymore. We've had it placed at the reservoir. We've had it placed behind Stop and Shop. Uh, I wonder if there's any long-range plans right now for getting ready for the next winter season instead of possibly you know, running around like willy-nilly and trying to find a place. Is there any plans down the road, Mr. Moderator, that this place is going to be designated for excess snow that we take off of the highway? Mr. Rodelbach, are you exploring a permanent snow dump for the town? Yes. Well, that's what they're called. Yes. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Michael Rodelbach, Director of Public Works. So we did have a plan this year. Uh, we were prepared. Um, we had permitted for a two or three years to put snow at the reservoir parking lot. Uh, we had a plan with the Conservation Commission, uh, with the manager's office, that we presented to the selectmen uh, before the start of winter, which uh, enabled us to basically handle uh, a winter such as we just had by placing snow um, at the reservoir. And then it, once that parking lot became too full, we trucked that, uh, had that trucked out of town by a vendor and disposed of off-site. Um, and that would be the plan for the next few years while we do look for potentially a better, uh, more long-term position. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, sir. Mr. Jamison? <coughs> Pass. Pass. And Mr. Wagner, last on the list. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Carl Wagner, Precinct 11. Um, I actually wanted to say, uh, given that we have distinguished international guests and uh, you haven't said it to us in recent years, and it feels like my five years or sometimes 500 years when we do budgets, supposing I decide that we should spend less money on one of these budget items or I feel that something should be changed in a budget, um, is talking and asking questions about it going to do anything more than inform the populace of our question? Can we actually make changes to current issues? You'd have to make a motion, obviously, uh, present a motion to the body, and the body would have to accept that motion and vote on it. If people want to change budget items, is there a recommended way that you or any of the members sitting behind me would, would suggest for future years? They have to write a substitute motion and give it to me the night before we're going to talk about it. But I would also before. recommend that if they have any issues with a the budget, they should meet with the Finance Committee starting in January and, the fi and entertain the Finance Committee on their recommendations because it is an open process. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Anyone else wish to discuss public works? Seeing none, we're going to move on to community safety. Someone wanted to discuss community safety. Mr. Harrington. 
Stephen Arrington, Precinct 13. I want to bring your attention down to the fire service uh, personnel. It's so it's on page B9. Um, under fire service, you have personnel expense um, expenses, and then you have this ambulance revolving fund offset, and it's $131,000. And we talked about this a little bit when we did the revolving funds. Remember that was the fund that had about $600,000 in revenue from the ambulance services. Now I'm going to give you a little background too. Uh, Medicare, um, about six weeks ago, released um, uh, their um, payments, first time in 46 years. And in the Medicare payment system, it shows the town of Arlington receiving $300,000, $200,000. $90,000. And Medicare, if you, if you actually take, they tell you how many service calls, and they break it up by advanced life support <coughs> and basic life support, much like that revolving fund did. And much like if you look in the, um, the town report, you'll see a little statistic on how many times <coughs> basic life support or advanced life support was used. And you can scale it. And so if you take the Medicare payments and you scale it, you come up with darn close to the $630,000 of revenue that appears in the revolving fund. And then what disturbed me is that you see $408,000 for contracted services to Armstrong Ambulance. And what I find disturbing is that I don't know why the town of Arlington isn't getting that money and why it's not showing up here to offset salaries. That's four or $5,000 per firefighter. And so my question, Mr. Moderator, is why this ambulance revolving fund offset is so low and why, what is, what contracted services are we providing, or, or that Armstrong, Armstrong's providing to us that gives them the lion's share of this ambulance revolving fund? Mr. Chaplain, do you wish to address that, please? Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. So the <clears throat> offset that uh, the speaker is referring to represents two firefighters' salary uh, as well as some fringe benefits. And what that represents is that any time we have two firefighters or EMTs riding our ambulance or our rescue. So that represents what we, every shift, have committed. Uh, two firefighters, two EMTs, or one and the same. Uh, we don't have paramedics. Uh, we, we don't provide paramedic level service, uh, also referred to as ALS or advanced life, uh, life support. So when we need ALS support, we contract with Armstrong Ambulance, and they provide the paramedic level of service. Uh, they obviously want to be compensated uh, for providing that service, so the revolving fund works just as it sounds. As a revolving fund, we collect the revenue from the provision of that paramedic level of service, and then we pay Armstrong Ambulance for the provision of that service. So I talked to Comstar today. Thank you, Mr. Chaplain. I talked to Comstar, who is a billing um, agent for municipalities that used to do it for Arlington. And paramedic services, he's right, about $250 for a paramedic for a ALS, and Medicare will give you back about $363 for the uh, payment for ALS. But that only explains half of it, because there's not a paramedic for BLS, and that's more than half of the total revenues in that fund. And so, well, Mr. Chaplain, you know, can give you sort of the off-the-cuff answer, I think there's actually about $100,000 to $200,000 that we're leaving on the table. And the most disturbing part of it is that the billing agent for the town of Arlington is also Armstrong Ambulance. So you have the person who's providing a service doing your billing for you, and I'd like to see that separated. Um, Mr. Moderator, could someone address why we've chosen to have uh, the person who's doing, or the, the entity that's doing uh, um, uh, servicing also doing our billing when we have a treasurer's office who can do billing, or there's certainly great service providers out there to do uh, this type of billing at the same or less expense. Chief Jefferson is going to address us. Robert Jefferson, Fire Chief. 
Um, the speaker's comments aren't exactly in line with how all the billing for the Town of Arlington's ambulance service is done. There's actually two ways that we build. When we build for ALS, which uh, Mr. Harrington is talking about, there's a 60-40 split between the Town of Arlington and Armstrong Ambulance. They get 60% of the revenue for that call, uh, the collected revenue, not the billed revenue, and the town receives 40% of it. So that's what you see when we, we pay out for the ALS, uh, that's what we're paying to Armstrong for the portion of the service, we get to keep 40% of that. When we transport a BLS patient, that money goes directly, whatever collected monies for that um, run may be, goes directly to the general fund is not, is, in, is not in that revolving fund. That's probably another four to $500,000 that we collect each year for BLS runs. Um, the reason that Armstrong Ambulance Service, or they actually call it Armstrong Billing Service, um, is our billing service is because we went out to bid several years ago. Uh, when I first took over, we found that Columstar, who was our previous biller, was not effective. Their billing collection rate was somewhere in the 80% range. Um, they were charging us 4% for every um, dollar of revenue that was recouped. And, um, and they were basically carrying old debt from back in the 90s, and that's when I took over in 2008. It was very inefficient, it was not up to speed. Um, it took us probably a year to go through all that time and, and, and find what the thing, um, where we stood with our billing. We put it out to bid, and um, the Arlington Building Company, Armstrong, came in at 3% of total um, collected revenues, as well as the, we are already, we're currently receiving somewhere in around the 92% collection uh, rate. Thank you, Chief. With all due respect, I'm going to give you two numbers, 400000 and 600,000. Revenues in the revolving fund are 600,000. We're paying a contract service provider 400,000. That's two thirds, roughly, exactly. And so um, the BLS component That's your time, sir. is half. Thank you. Um, Ma'am. Yep. Uh, Debbie Edelstein, Precinct 9. Between uh, fire and police services, we spend a million dollars a year in overtime. And my question, I could ask it in a bunch of ways, but ultimately, are we short-staffed um, is one question. Um, I, I can imagine that some of this is, is by negotiation, but a million dollars is a million dollars. And I'd hate to think that public safety is compromised because we have people working more shifts than they should be because we're short-staffed. Chief Ryan? Chief Ryan, please. Good evening, Frederick Ryan, Chief of Police. There are a number of uh, factors that drive uh, that over time. On the police side, you know, uh, testifying in court is a big piece of it. And also, whenever there's a vacancy, both on the police side and the fire side, it takes about two years to recruit hire and train a new police officer or a firefighter. I think I can speak for Chief Jefferson as well. And um, so during that vacancy, um, uh, during that recruitment and hiring training process, we have to backfill the vacancy. So um, that drives a lot of it as well. And then there's the contracted vacations and, and, um, and personal days. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Kleinman. Good evening, Stuart Kleinman, Precinct 1. I'm up here to say that I don't really care how much it costs. I'm also up here to say that the reason I'm up here is because a number of years ago, it was Armstrong Ambulance that arrived at my house within minutes upon my having a heart attack. They saved my life. I hope that never happens again, but I do hope that that happens to anybody else that is in need of quick medical care. So what does it matter what we are paying to anybody 
that is in need of medical care. We just pass this budget because we need to serve our citizens in the area of immediate health care. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Jamison. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Gordon Jamison, Precinct 12. Um, some of the discussion, so first I wanted, I was uh, off the floor um, talking to Mr. Donnelly uh, last session when the revolving funds come up, came up, and long-term members know that that's been something that has been an interest of mine. And I want to applaud the manager and his staff for providing that additional information in the back of the uh, selectman's report that addresses uh, some granularity on where those numbers go. Uh, um, in chatting with uh, Mr. Chaplain, um, I learned that they found that that exercise useful and they learned a lot of things about, um, they g gained a, f a greater understanding, including that $400,000 that was mentioned previously. Um, as far as the offsets go from that fund, if you look in your capital plan, which hopefully we'll get to, um, there's about $50,000 um, that that fund is used to offset the cost of an ambulance, the, the debt service on that, and that's appropriate. And it also is used to, as I understand, um, in part in response to questions I posed in previous, sessions, previous years, to offset um, several fire fire positions that are um, off the formal budget, but supported by, appropriately, again, in my uh, regard, through the uh, revolving fund. Um, so I'm sorry to have to get there and provide some discussion, but I think that's all very well managed and above board. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wish to discuss community safety? Seeing none, that closes that budget. The next budget that was placed on hold was education. Mr. Hainer. Phil Hainer, Chairman of the Arlington School Committee. Mr. Moderator, I would ask the Superintendent, Dr. Bodie, be allowed to come forward to give a brief presentation on the school department. Please, Dr. Bodie. Kathleen Bodie. Uh, Mike, I want to bring the, there you go. Good evening. Kathleen Bodie, Superintendent of Schools. Good evening, Mr. Moderator, town meeting members, and, and town officials. And thank you for this opportunity to speak. I know that you're very interested in having a brief report, and so I will try to, to comply as best as possible. Um, Mr. Hayner mentioned earlier this evening in his remarks that the school department has been um, experienced significant enrollment growth over the last decade and certainly within the last two years. Um, and this enrollment growth has uh, posed the challenge of our being able to meet all the needs of our students. This last fall, we, the school department met with the town manager, the finance committee, um, the school committee to work collaboratively to find a solution to this problem, which we did which involves an, a, an enrollment growth factor. And I do want to thank everyone who was involved in this process for their willingness to, to find a solution. Can you go to the chart? The, uh, the chart, there we go. Um, this chart shows the difference between the FY14 and 15 budgets. Um, the general fund increased, as you know, by 3.5% and special ed by 7.5%. And I do want to take this moment to say that the school department is committed to maintaining this financial plan for the town of Arlington. And so we're keeping the growth um, factor as a separate number. Um, in, in doing so, what, we're, what, what will happen is that there, this will, there will be an increase each year, but if there is an enrollment in decrease, then this amount will also go down. The other, the other um, continuation this year is having a $970,000 offset for um, the kindergarten fees. Because of this um, offset and the work we did last year, we now have a tuition-free full-day kindergarten. And as a result of this change, the Chapter 70 money uh, allocation for FY14 increased by over $1.9 million, but not um, primarily, but not exclusively to this change. 
There is a lot more um, detail about the school department budget in the budget book that you were, um, that was distributed on the first night of town meeting. There is also, for those that are watching the cable, um, you should know that that report, as well as a complete uh, budget for the school department, is, is, can be found on the district website. This next chart demonstrates the Arlington Public School budget by funding sources, and the purpose of this is just to remind everyone that um, about 10% of the school department budget actually comes from grants and fees. The um, FY15 budget allows us next year to maintain level service, which includes step, uh, contractual step lane and college uh, increases for our employees. We will also be able to mitigate class sizes, which have become large in, in recent years due to the enrollment growth, and particularly at the middle and the high school. Next year, for example, we will be adding an additional four classroom cluster at the middle school. We will also be able to provide the necessary staff to, sure, to ensure equity um, and quality education for all of our students, which will include uh, a number of positions, uh, several positions staff to provide support and coaching for behavior management, and at the elementary level, we will increase our, our mathematics coaching by another position. The out-of-district um, tuitions will be represented in the next budget so that we um, support our current placements. We are also going to increase infrastructure support for technology um, to ensure the timely rollout and support of the expanded technology it was provided by the generous support of the Capital Planning Committee, which you'll hear more about um, maybe this evening, and the Arlington Educational Foundation. The next graph um, demonstrates the FY budget by major expense categories. And the one thing I would want to point out on this graph is the, um, the wedge for inter interventions for nearly $3 million. These, um, this amount of money um, helps support our most struggling students, and, and one example of that intervention is our elementary reading program. The FY14 budget supports the vision of the Arlington Public Schools, and this is, this is actually important, and I won't read everything, but we are committed to making sure that every graduate is ready for college, career, and active citizenship. And we do this by fostering a culture of continuous improvement, cost effectively, and with partnership with all of our town departments and other, st and other stakeholders. Um, I will leave you with some highlights for the Arlington Public Schools in 2013 and 14, many more of which are in the book, book that you have. The one highlight, however, that I do want to point out is the gold medal distinction given to Arlington High School in the recent edition of U.S. News and World Report, Best High School Rankings. Arlington High School ranked 21st among 75 Massachusetts public high schools that met the criteria for ranking. There are, however, 352 high schools in the Commonwealth. Nationally, the high school ranked 465 out of 31,242 schools, high, public high schools. These rankings are based on several metrics. The school's performance on the state assessment in math and English language art, which is MCAS. How well are most disadvantaged students, the students represented we call subgroups, how they perform and then they measure college readiness by the exam scores on advanced placement tests. So congrats, much congratulations goes to the high school staff and teachers, but also to all Arlington Public School educators because the preparation for rigorous courses at the high school begins at a much earlier age. And as, and as I mentioned, part of the vision of the Arlington Public Schools is to have a cost-effective education, and I will tell you that and those of you could look this up, that um, among the high schools that were given the gold medal distinction, Arlington had one of the lowest costs per pupil. 
So with this, I will end my remarks, and um, we'll certainly be glad to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bodhi. Mr. Carmen. Dean Carmen, Precinct 20, and a member of the Finance Committee. Um, so this is going to sound weird as I start to say it, but I think it'll make a little more sense. Um, I, I do want to take a sec to thank our town leaders for something, um, and that is how they dealt with the school enrollment issue this year. Um, in a lot of towns, you have these weird situations where you have the t a town manager who represents the town, and you have a you know superintendent of schools that represents the schools. Now, I don't know what town the schools belong to in those towns, but they somehow don't belong to one another. And they sort of battle back and forth, and they don't agree with each other, and then sometimes if you're a volunteer on the finance committee, you have the unenviable task of sorting these messes out, which frankly, as a volunteer, I have no effort to do, and I don't think anyone else in the finance committee has any effort to do. Um, one of the really nice things that happened this year, sort of I guess one of those these insider things you, you would say is, by the time we had started our finance committee session this year, the leadership of the school committee, the leadership of the um, Board of Selectmen, the Finance Committee, the Town Manager, the Superintendent, all got together and figured out how they were going to deal with this enrollment challenge in terms of additional funding and funding mechanisms and things like that. Um, and so I did want to sort of point that out and, and thank all of them for that because I don't think, you know, as a Finance Committee member, as a Town Meeting member, that you really feel like you need to deal with people that can't get along. And while it seems strange sometimes to think that executive leadership wouldn't get along in a town, you'd be surprised that there are many communities where it doesn't happen. So once again, to all the leaders of the different boards, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks for pointing that out. Mr. Chaput. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator, Roland Chapter Precinct 12. Um, I just want to uh, ask the superintendent through the moderator about a situation in terms of enrollment that we addressed last year, and that had to do with fair loading in each of the elementary schools. You, you remember that the Thompson School was under construction, and the kids from that neighborhood were going up to Stratton, and I think in one of the other schools, and once, this, once the Thompson opened, those youngsters came back, there was a lot of discussion around each of the elementary schools in the community as to which, which streets, if, it, if you will, would be sending their youngsters to that particular school. And then there was a, uh, how you pronounce it, around each of those districts there were some streets that were up in the air about which way they would go. So I guess my curiosity here is, how has that worked out? Okay, well, Dr. Bode, can you address redistricting? It's really a school committee issue, but I'll entertain the question. Last year it worked out very well. The, the, the vast majority of people in the high 80% had their first preference. And we have a very, uh, very clear protocol for how um, we go, up, uh, we, we assign students. It's basically looking at the enrollments at a particular grade and just trying to balance those enrollments. But people also are able to go on a wait list and the wait list is set up based on the date of registration and then um, for those that register on the same day by lottery. And we were able to do um, a number of waitlist changes um, over the course of the summer. What, what the, the, um, the, even though most people had their first preference, what was able to happen is we were, we were able to start addressing the problem um, of unequitable class sizes. And I will say that this year I'm seeing even more of that. We have now uh, kindergarten coming in right now is our 495, and I expect it'll probably go over 500 before the school year. But by having the buffer zones, we're able to at least at this stage have some equity among our kindergartens. And in the past, 
we could have you know very different um, numbers and we could also potentially have the way the numbers would work um, require an extra kindergarten or class somewhere. So it is working, um, but it's very much um, a tweaking to what, what is happening in our schools rather than a major, a major redistricting. Thank you, Dr. Rohde. Um, Mr. Harrington, pass. Anyone else wish to discuss the education budget? Seeing none, that ends, that terminates that budget. The next hold was on libraries. Ah, man. Michelle DeRocher, Precinct 19. Uh, Mr. Moderator, I have a number of questions, perhaps for the, uh, the director of the library system, um, through you. Mm -hmm. I'd like to first off hear just a report on the status of the state accreditation. I know in prior years that had been um, a, a point uh, of vulnerability for the library system, which I believe was fully corrected last year um, and wanted a status on that. Mr. Livergood? Everybody's been moved around because of the computers. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Ryan Livergood, Director of Libraries. I'm happy to report that um, we are in good shape with uh, staying, uh, maintaining our uh, certification with the state of Massachusetts. Um, we're meeting um, the um, municipal appropriation requirement again this year. Great, thank you. Um, another question in the budget summary in the Finance Committee report, there are two sections of the budget that show very large percent changes. Um, the first one being in the children's librarian category with over 550% change, which strikes me as a programmatic you know, setting of priorities, and I wondered if you could comment on that. Yeah, um, the way this reflects here is just a bit skewed um, to what the reality is. Um, if you look back in 2014, children's librarian, you'll see one part-time position. Um, what happened in 2015, there's a position showing up that is the Fox Friday librarian. Um, before that wasn't, um, it, it was reflected in the budget, but in kind of a way that wasn't as transparent as it could have been. So if you'll look this year under 2015, there's a Friends of Fox offset because thanks to, we have two wonderful friends groups. I think most of you know that. One of those groups is the Friends of Fox and they fund uh, Fridays at the Fox. The reason the Fox has been on Fridays is because of that friends group. So that position is reflected there and we did reallocate a position. We had uh, um, some retirements this past year and there was someone that used to be in the adult services department that was reallocated to the children's department. Um, if any of you ever use our children's services, you'll know that it is, is booming. We just heard about the schools and how we are, that we're seeing increased enrollment in the schools. That's also reflected in the library system as well. So that, th those are the, the, two, the two factors that, that attribute that, that change. It, it, it looks very striking, but essentially it's just one more person in, in that, um, that children's department. Thank you. Um, and the other section that shows a, a large percent change is in overtime, and I understand that that is for Sunday hours. Is that correct? That is correct. And do you consider that sort of an experimental thing that you're doing this year to see how it goes and in future years we would see that elsewhere in the budget and perhaps a more cost-effective uh, line item? Sure. Um, historically, um, the, the, the story of Sunday hours is, um, is complex, um, but let me just limit it to the past five years or so. Um, the library used to receive much more state aid to libraries than we receive now. Um, and we were able to fund Sunday hours through that library state aid. Um, when we saw that number decrease around FY09, um, the Board of Trustees worked with the, the uh, library director at the time, Marianne Loud, who went to the town manager at the time, Brian Sullivan, and um, it, it was agreed that if the, the trustees could raise money to fund Sunday hours, that we could have Sunday hours. Um, so money was raised uh, when we started that effort. There was a, a large initial um, donation to get those the Sundays going, um, and over time, uh, although people have been very generous supporting Sunday hours, that that's diminished. 
and we were, uh, we were reaching a point where it was going to be difficult for us to maintain those Sunday hours. Um, and what's happened o o over the past five years, people love Sundays. We're only open three hours on Sundays, and, and we see tremendous usage, and it's a real demand. Um, you look at the Vision 2020 survey, one of the things that's reflected is that people want weekend hours. People want summer weekend hours now, and, and th that would be a wonderful thing for us to have. Um, so the Sundays are really important to the community. A lot of working families can't make it to the library other than the weekends in Arlington. And so would you say in next year's budget cycle you'll be looking for a more structural change to account for that rather than in overtime? Um, the, the reason it's reflected in overtime is because it is, um, it is not obligatory for library staff to work on Sundays. There are some uh, uh, collective bargaining issues that, that come into play here, and that's why it shows up in overtime. Hopefully that answers your question. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Livergood. Thank you, Mr. Rocha. Anyone else wish to discuss libraries? That closes that budget. The next budget that was placed on hold is retirement. Mr. Harrington. Oh, Mr. Jameson next. Stephen Harrington, Precinct 13. Um, I want to draw your attention to two things. If you look at uh, page B12 of the budget book, under retirement, so you have contributory pensions, you have the water sewer offset, another million dollars. And um, if you look, there's a 5.92% increase. And if you look year to year, I know this is just budgets, but in this one I believe it's real. Um, you know, it's pretty much 6% a year. So um, uh, it's a large amount of money as well. It's the same size as, say, the capital budget. So um, it's a lot to go up 6% a year and expect it to be able to. Now, Arlington has to do this. Arlington um, has, uh, the, the, they actually rate towns on their um, pension, and um, they have to be, by law, fully funded by 2040. And um, Arlington's, I believe, is in the low 50s right now, so it's about 50, say, 3% funded. And that gives Arlington an F. Uh, just to put it in perspective, um, um, Minuteman is 100% funded. They get an A. There's only a couple municipalities that get A's. But, um, my understanding, and Mr. Martyr, I'm going to ask this question, that um, once you put in, say, this year, $9.5 million, that becomes your high watermark. And from every year after that, you have to put in at least that amount. And so, you know, the last few years when we've been flush with cash, it's been sort of an easy thing to do to try to catch up and beat that 2040 statutory limit. But, you know, Part of me sort of cringes, you know, that we're doing it, see the markets reach highs, this is when we're putting most of our money in. Um, we're trying to keep budgets at, you know, 3.4, whatever the number is supposed to be, and one of the largest components are at six. And so, um, um, I, I, Ms. Martin, I guess I have the question first is, is that my understanding correct that there's a high watermark that with the pension we have to put in at least nine and a half million dollars on a go forward basis. Mr. Tosti, can you address that? Yes, Mr. Harrington is right. We, um, we have to have a fully funded pension system by 2040. Uh, and uh, right now we're projected to be fully funded in 2032. And uh, one of the agreements that we've made over the years with the retirement board because they really control to a large degree this is that we would cap it at six percent um, and uh, they've been able to keep it now it's a little over six percent now because the Arlington Housing Authority is also in the same fund so it just doesn't quite work out to exactly six percent sometimes a little higher sometimes it's a little lower uh, but they're involved in that too um, so a good chunk of this increase is, is to fund uh, services for retirees from the past. In other words, you know, back in the 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s and really even probably half of the 80s, we were just pay-as-you-go. 
that's it. Nobody was funding anything. And then about 1988, I think, the state passed a law that said you have to start funding for, for uh, your retirement so it's fully funded. So uh, I'm guessing about half of the say is to uh, become fully funded as opposed to pay as you go. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Jameson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Gordon Jameson, Precinct 12. Um, uh, I, I'm disappointed that we did not see, even though this, this number is a number that's given to us by the Retirement Board and we have no control over it, it, it is it's completely in their hands and we have to pass it. If we don't, it's still appropriated. Um, I'm disappointed that the Retirement Board um, has not seen fit to uh, provide us with an update on uh, things beyond the comments Mr. Tosti um, provided. Um, and re the retur recent returns on the investment, majority of which is now in the state system, thank goodness, um, and uh, how they're doing on the small percentage that they're still managing on their own. I would hope that next year there would be a much greater detail both in both in the financial plan that the manager's office uh, presents and is online beyond the, I think, one page that's in here and nothing in the annual report that I saw, I just checked earlier, and obviously nothing for us. I hope that they uh, give us an update because like Mr. Harrington said, this is a lot of money. Thank you. Thank you, sir, Mr. Chapit. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator, Roland Chapman, Precinct 12. Um, I, I held off asking this question until we got into the retirement budget because I'm retired. I don't really have a fuss with the numbers. What I do have a fuss with, I can't read the numbers. So I would suggest, please, in the future, two things. Make the font a little larger. If you look at the school committee budget, their numbers I could read without a problem. Number two, if, if it's not already available, put the budget on the website so I can read it at home and blow the numbers up so I can see them. Thank you. I bought a magnifying glass. I gave up asking. All right, anyone else wish to discuss retirement? Seeing none, that closes that budget. Brings us to insurance. Who had a hold on insurance? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Marvin Lewitton, Precinct 16. I think it was five years ago that we needed to add $100,000 to the workers' comp budget. Um, while thankfully that number has not increased since, I would like to think that we could hopefully drop it a little bit. Um, the State Department of Labor Standards recently started a program that provides free occupational health and safety consulting to municipalities. And I guess I would strongly encourage the heads of any department whose employees have filed a comp claim to take advantage of this in the hope that we can make this number smaller in coming years. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wish to discuss insurance? Mr. Fisher? Uh, Andrew Fisher, Precinct 16, I mean Precinct 6. <laughs> um, I'm not sure where to ask this question, but can, Mr. Moder, can somebody explain more specifically why it is that in 2020 um, so much of the stabilization fund will have to be spent? Just, I understand there are structural deficits. I don't ex understand exactly what it is and where, where the money's gonna go all of a sudden, or does it start to go downhill in 2017. It's just a question I have. I'd like to understand that more explicitly. Thank you. Mr. Tosti, can you address Mr. Fisher's question? Restabilization funds. Unfortunately, several of the major um, fixed costs of the town uh, grow at a certain level. Uh, one of them, for example, we just discussed was retirement. That's going up 6%. And that's a very big number. 
Uh, so, you, so you have that. You have health insurance, uh, which was growing at in the range of eight to ten percent, well, seven to ten percent, until uh, several, uh, two years ago when we entered the GIC, and we've been able to hold that down to a certain degree. Um, you have um, you have salaries and cost of living. Over the last five years, we've given two zeros. Um, so, so you have some costs which are just increasing, which are very difficult to deal with, but you also have um, some major elements of our revenue which just aren't growing. I mean, uh, our state aid has been a disaster in the 2000s. Uh, when we got first hit in 2000 by a recession, uh, our state aid got hit fairly drastically and then in the middle of the 2000s started to recover a little bit, not to where it was, but to recover a little bit. And then, um, uh, and then we got hit again by the Great Recession of 2008, and we got whacked again with, with insurance. Uh, w uh, sorry, uh, with, um, with cutbacks in our state aid. Our state aid is probably someplace about where it was in the, in the late 80s. I mean, you know, that, that's what's happened to it. And, uh, during the 80s, we were getting five, six, seven hundred thousand increase in local aid every year. During the 90s, we were getting, uh, it started off around two or three hundred. By the mid to late, we were getting five or six hundred thousand new local aid a year. In the 2000s, it's probably overall been a negative. When we can't get five, you know, five, six, seven hundred thousand dollars in increased local aid each year, we're going to have to go back for overrides. And unfortunately, uh, during the 80s, the, the legislature and the governor at that time had a strong commitment to local government. During the 2000s, they had a commitment to education, but not necessarily to all of local government. And during the 2000 uh, period, the, the, the commitment to local aid has really not been terribly strong. Uh, the, the governor, in his recommendation, hardly gave us any increase. The House has increased that a bit, but not all that much. Um, so I think, you know, the local aid has is, is, is been a major factor um, on that. And, um, you know, we're going to try like heck to, uh, to bring that deficit in 2020 down as much as we can. Um, but there'll probably still be a deficit. Hopefully it'll be, you know, manageable enough with a reasonable override that we can get by it. But. Um, you know, if we're going to keep the services we have now uh, at that level, um, we, we need the revenues to back it. And, uh, you know, over the last 12, 14 years, we just have not been getting that kind of support. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else wish to discuss insurance? Seeing none, that closes the insurance budget. Water and sewer was the next budget put on hold. Mr. Harrington. Stephen Harrington, Precinct 13. So um, we started this conversation last week. Um, if you'll look at your budget book on B14, you'll see the um, Water and Sewer Enterprise Fund. I first want to draw your attention to the fact it's almost $20 million. So it's the second largest budget that you have <coughs> that you're looking at tonight behind education. It's twice the capital budget. Um, I just want to break it down, you know, because it took me a while. I mean, I still don't fully understand it, and so I'll have some questions. But, you know, if you look at it, first of all, uh, user charges. You know, that's us. Um, so those are your water bills, and you see that it's up 12.7% for the user charges um, year on year. And over the um, three-year period you're seeing here, you know, three-year ch changes, it's up on... Um, or 22%. And so, you know, it's increasing a lot. And I think everyone knows that, you know, water bills. So when we look at property taxes, you know, we don't seem to think about, you know, water bills, but, you know, I, I just mailed up mine with $500 uh, bill the other day. If you look at the next line down, you see shift of debt to tax rate. So that shows up in your property tax bill. And that's the, I think it's 86 cents on the 1379 property tax rate. And you can see it's, it's 40% or 30% of, um, uh, of the total user charges plus your tax bill 
Um, and so about 30% of the cost of the water and sewer enterprise fund is borne by people um, uh, through their property taxes. And um, it's not done equally. It's not based on usage. It's based on the value of your property. And so um, that's something I think that people don't fully appreciate. Um, when we talked about, you know, uh, what it means we're subsidizing someone somehow, it turns out that actually people more likely to have large properties and irrigation systems are actually subsidizing everyone else. And this is how you can see it. Um, it's about 30 to 40 percent of the total um, over the last four years. So, so those two add up to about $19 million. And, you know, we, we, if you look at the first line up at the top, you can see that there's some personnel expenses and there's other expenses that are mostly the MWRA infrastructure charges and water itself and uh, the sewer treatment. And then you look down, you see the capital outlay and debt service. And this is what I wanted to talk about the other night. It's $2.1 million in this budget. And it's been, you know, 1.6 to 2.1. If you look over the last five years and you add up those loans that we approved one of them, we still have one to go they total about nine million bucks. And so their five-year loans means every year we're paying off about two million dollars of the loans that we maybe took out five years ago or maybe they're, you know, this um, stepped in one, uh, one fifth every year. But then if you look at the capital budget, and especially this year, you'll see that there's a lot more in the capital budget than just paying back those loans. And over a five-year period, that capital budget is $15 million. So this year in particular is very large. You'll see in your capital budget that there's uh, over $4 million uh, for water and sewer enterprise fund in the capital budget. And this is the question I just, you know, like I said earlier, financial statements should be clarify questions. They shouldn't make it difficult to find information. And I just can't see how if we're taking out of this fund $2 million to pay salaries and pension costs, so personnel costs, but we're putting in, we're, we're appropriating through bonding or the capital budget more than the fund itself is paying out on the order of, it's about $2 million bucks a year. I don't see, and this is a question I have, Mr. Moderator, and I asked the town manager to, you know, to clarify this for me, so I'm hoping that he's prepared. I asked him last week. How is this not a shell game? How are we not using operating expenses by using debt? Mr. Chaplin, do you understand that question? Adam Chaplin, town manager. So they're, um, they're, they're really separate matters. They're all covered by the revenue sources that the speaker has spoken about. There's the uh, money that is charged uh, based on rates, and then there is the amount of money that's raised on the tax rate, uh, the debt shift, the $5.5 million amount. Uh, so a as the speaker mentioned, there are debt service payments that are appropriated to service the debt uh, that's issued under the other warrant articles that we've talked about earlier in the meeting. And then there's also direct capital appropriations uh, that aren't borrowed. They're direct cash appropriations, which are supported by the rates that are charged for water and sewer. Now, separate from that, uh, you've heard a lot of talk about water and sewer indirect charges or water sewer offsets. And they really, they, they make up two primary areas. There are offsets that take care of the actual employees who work directly for the water sewer enterprise fund. Uh, and those are their retirement and health care offsets. So the retirement costs attributable to water sewer employees, uh, monies come from the water sewer fund and offset the general fund appropriations that we've already spoken about uh, for both retirement and health insurance. Then the other side of it is uh, the water sewer fund uh, supplementing, or supplementing would be the word, uh, wrong word, supporting the general fund expenditures that are used to support the water and sewer enterprise funds. So there's a great deal of offsets used to support other DPW functions that support water sewer. Engineering does a great deal of work for water sewer. Administration, I know uh, Mr. Rademacher's time and most, a lot of his staff's time is spent on this large $20 million budget in DPW, uh, as well as highway, and as well as other smaller administrative departments, including the town manager's office, the treasurer's office, the comptroller, IT, legal, and so forth. 
Uh, so there are personnel offsets for the personnel time that's spent uh, in each of those offices, as well as smaller offsets for the portion of the health insurance cost and retirement costs for those offices as well. So those all add up to the indirect costs uh, that you're, um, that, uh, excuse me, that have been spoken about. So they're, they're really, they are separate. Uh, there is a capital portion of the water sewer budget that is again supported by rates, and there's also the offset portion, which I just spoke about, which is also supported by rates. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Anyone else wish to discuss water and sewer? If not, that closes the water and sewer budget. Recreation. Who wish to discuss recreation? Seeing none, move on. The last one someone wished to discuss was youth, serv youth services division. Who wish to discuss youth services? No one. Okay. That ends the budget. So. We have before us a recommended vote of the Finance Committee on all the budgets we've discussed. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. Was that unanimous? It's a unanimous vote, and I so declare it. That closes all Article 28 and brings us to 29. We have a motion to adjourn till the Wednesday. All, all in, any notices of reconsideration? Let's vote with our clickers to con Mr. Flynn, you ready? All in favor of uh, adjourning till Wednesday, please vote yes. yes. No, use your clicker. Go. What? We got a clock. Tosti voted. Alan Tosti gave notice of reconsideration on Article 29 and 28. Time's up. 160 to adjourn. We'll see you on Wednesday. Six no's. If we really uh, diligent, we could probably get done Wednesday.